Hello, welcome everybody. Can you let me know in the chat maybe if, if it's working? Hello, welcome everybody. I'll just wait until I see some uh, chat activity before I start, just to check. Okay, great, thank you, Sammy. So hello everyone, welcome to the first um, Maths and Physics Summer School hosted by the University of Lincoln. Uh, my name's Matthew Booth, I'm a lecturer here at the University of Lincoln, uh, as is Dave Stafford. And I'm also joined by uh, Andrei Zvelandowski. He's a professor in physics, he's the head of the school. Um, so I'll pass over him for the first minute or so, just to give a quick introduction, and then we'll go to Dave's talk. So over to you, Andrei. Thank you very much, Matt. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Professor Andrei Zvilindovsky, Head of School of Mathematics and Physics at the University of Lincoln. Uh, very warm welcome to everyone who come to this virtual uh, School of Mathematics and Physics. And, and we, we hope that after attending classes of math and physics, uh, you would like actually visit Lincoln in person and perhaps visit our university. During such visit, you will discover the Lincoln a small uh, but very beautiful Asian city founded by Romans almost 2,000 years ago. Uh, this is where the name Lincoln comes from, from Latin Lindum Colonia. Uh, the city also flourished in Middle Ages. Uh, Lincoln has uh, one of most beautiful, if not the most beautiful cathedral in the Uni United Kingdom. And our students have their graduation ceremony inside of Lincoln Cathedral. Uh, the purpose of this uh, uh, school that you enjoy uh, classes in mathematics and physics. Uh, uh, you will meet lecturers of our school and perhaps you will decide to look a little bit deeper on degrees we can offer. And I'll just very briefly mention our school has full range of degrees uh, in mathematics and in physics uh, from three years bachelor's degrees uh, uh, to four years integrated master's. Uh, we have also standalone uh, master in physics uh, and we have a uh, whole range of uh, research degrees, master's and doctorate in uh, uh, pure and applied mathematics in, uh, in varieties of fields of physics. And also, if somebody interested in uh, joint uh, uh, degrees, like if somebody likes several subjects, we also have uh, such uh, opportunities. Uh, we have uh, joint integrated degrees, math and physics. We have math and computer science. And even we have mathematics with philosophy and physics with philosophy. So uh, today you will meet academics and also will meet graduates of all those degrees, uh, our former students working in various parts of the uh, United Kingdom. Very warm well welcome and uh, have a good time during these two days virtual summer school. Thank you very much, Andre. So uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yes, so it's now time to go to our first speaker, Dave Spafford. So Dave is a lecturer in the foundation year here at Lincoln, and he's going to talk about some particle physics. So, Dave, uh, we've got your slides here. I'll remove Thank my you, Matt. And over to you. Okay. So, uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome from me. I'd encourage all of you, uh, please do, if you've got any questions or if you've got any comments, then please do get involved and email me. Uh, I shall try to respond as quickly as I can uh, over the next few days. So, I do get to work in a lovely place. I know Andre said that, but I'm doing it from a slightly more selfish point of view in that being a scientist is fabulous. Uh, I, over the last year, got to work in some nice places. We own that too. That's where we go for away days. Um, it is a great life. So I know that we've seen science on the news over the past year, but anybody who's considering a career, please do consider science. I don't think there's been any better time to be a scientist and really feel like you're doing some good for the world. So in my talk this morning, uh, we're going to talk a bit about particle physics. Specifically, then, uh, I would like to talk about the exchange model of forces, the exchange particle model. And in particular, then, I think it's useful for these people who are watching a little bit later on YouTube. If you're an A-level student, if you're a GCSE student, if you're just a member of the public or a teacher, uh, then I hope this should be interesting for you, and it should give you a little bit of a taster of what a little bit of university physics might be. So here's my plan. Uh, we're going to start from Rutherford, and actually his, you often learn about one experiment in school, but he did a whole series. 
Uh, we're then having looked at that and we found a few problems. Then we'll look at the particle exchange model, so our current understanding. Uh, we're going to introduce Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Now, this is usually never introduced before you get to university, but it's quite straightforward and we could do some nice things with that. So we'll introduce that. That should take us to explain the range of a force and we'll talk about the mass of an exchange particle too. And then there's a really lovely bit at the end which should tie up some issues which you might not have noticed uh, when we just learn about the strong force and the electromagnetic force. And all along the way, then I would expect us to do a bit of mathematics, maybe draw some Feynman diagrams. So if you have a minute, I would get a piece of paper out and perhaps just look out a calculator if you want to take part in that. So you can make a few notes if you want to on the way through. So let's start with Ernest Rutherford. And he really is called the father of nuclear physics. So I hope you can see my cursor just here. But this is Rutherford just here on the right, smoking in the lab. This is um, Ratcliffe just to the left of him. But this, this sign above here is quite interesting because it says, talk softly, please. By all accounts, then Rutherford had this great, deep, booming voice. And this was at the Cavendish lab where, where they did some of the most important work. Um, specifically the gold foil experiments, but some of the equipment was really quite sensitive to vibrations. So he used to come in and by all accounts, he would talk in this deep booming voice and upset some of the equipment. So this sign was put up here supposedly for the benefit of Rutherford. But the whole series of them, and you only really learn about one, and I'm going to focus on one, which was the 1913 one, but this was a whole series of experiments, right, from 1908 right up to 1913 and, and beyond. They carried on up to 1917 through the First World War. Um, but this was the really important one. It was the 1913 one, and it was completed by Hans Geiger and Ernest Marsden. Ernie Marsden was actually an undergraduate at the time, and they fired alpha particles at a really thin piece of gold foil. And having fired them there, they expected all of them to go pretty much straight through, given their models of the atom at the time. And they did know that atoms existed. What happened? And over the course of the few years previous, they'd realized that some, not very many, but a very small number, actually were bounced back off the gold foil. And they described this as like firing a cannonball at a piece of tissue paper and the cannonball coming back at you. Now, don't think that it was just a description. There was a lot of theory. So Rutherford eventually managed to describe this theory. He sort of had the idea that uh, an atom wasn't a big ball of stuff, a big ball of positive stuff with electrons sort of stuffed in it. They called it the plum pudding model. But he eventually figured out that there must be a really small region at the center, something very, very heavy, really highly charged, and that this thing was responsible for some of these bouncing back. And it was small, so not very, very many of them hit it, so that he thought it was about a ten thousandth of the actual diameter of the atom. For those of you doing A-level maths, you'll notice here, so let me just give you a few things in this. S is the number that go in over here. It's the number of particles that head off in this direction. X is the number that come in over here. Phi is the angle round. And you'll notice that the number that head off in this direction, Rutherford's theory said that that was proportional to cosec of phi over 2 all to the power of 4. So if you're doing A-level maths, if you haven't met cosec yet, then it's 1 divided by the sine of x. So uh, it's something that I doubt whether you'll find many uses for uh, in A-level mathematics, but it does crop up in physics. Now, there's a few problems with this, but what does it predict? Well, you could do the calculations now yourself if you just work out uh, the cosine of 5 degrees and of the 90 and the 180. But the numbers are huge. So for every 280,000 that are scattered by about 5 degrees, that's somewhere here, we'd expect probably about 4 to be scattered at 90 degrees. So for every 280,000 ending up here, we'd expect perhaps four to end up just here, and only one to be scattered directly backwards. So you can imagine that collecting this data back in 1913 from a piece of equipment where you were literally looking down a little telescope to see a little flash of green light and you're counting these, this was painstaking work and really time consuming. And certainly it took place in a darkened room and it was long work. 
So that's why these younger scientists were doing it. Geiger and Marsden did it because Rutherford didn't really have the patience, uh, by all accounts, I imagine, anyway. So here's where we ended up. So after Rutherford's experiments and the work of Geiger and Marsden, we figured out that an atom had a very small region just here, and this isn't to scale. I'll talk about that in a minute. And the electrons were flying around the outside somewhere. Now, I've taught this here for 16 years, and I know that this is taught in schools, and we're taught that the electrons orbit around the outside. Um, this is a bit out of date, but it, every time I've taught this, and I've said this is how it is, there has not been a single student who has said to me, well, Dave, that's ridiculous. That's preposterous. Of course the electrons are not going to go around there. Why don't they just go and stick to it? Uh, if they're attracted to it, we're told that they go around the outside because they're attracted to it. Great. Well, why don't they go and stick to it? That is one problem with this. And certainly Rutherford didn't have any answers to that. Uh, also, the second problem is we have protons in the center. Why are they sticking together? Why aren't they flying apart? That's the second problem. And later, after we discover the neutron, the next question is neutrons are neutral and shouldn't be attracted to the protons, and yet they stick together. The problem with this diagram, too, is that the nucleus is drawn on here way too big. So if you want to scale here, and I've chosen Wembley for uh, things, I think Wembley is the biggest stadium in the world. Uh, so it's perhaps a little too big. But if an atom were the size of a football stadium, then the nucleus would be about the size of a pea. Uh, somewhere near the center. So the nucleus really is very, very small indeed compared to the size of an atom. So what's the key point? Well, following Rutherford, right back in 1913, we really at that point had very little understanding of these forces. We thought we did. We understood positive and negative attract, positive repel, and so on, but actually figuring out that the atom didn't look how that would suggest said, well, we don't really understand the forces between them and what's going on. So let's fast forward a little bit, because this was really uh, born, Max Born started to figure out what was going on, and then his theory, which is really what we're taught in school. So in schools, and we often teach the electrons orbit around the outside, that picture's been out of date for the best part of 100 years. That idea was supplanted in 1925, twice, by Heisenberg, Born, and Jordan. They developed matrix mechanics. And Erwin Schrödinger, who developed wave mechanics, both of them explained it perfectly well, and they later showed the two things. Although they'd been developed completely separately, it turned out the two things were exactly the same. So we had this stage, and we got to the stage where we had a nucleus. There must be a force stronger than the electromagnetic force, which is holding the protons and neutrons together in the center. That's, that'll probably sound fairly familiar. And then the electrons are sort of somewhere outside this. They are held in by the electromagnetic force. But we've got the question of, uh, of here, why uh, don't they go and stick to the nucleus? Well, it turns out that we can get a very long way just with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So let's fast forward. We, don't, we can't explain what's going on. We've got too many problems with this model that most of the time we just gloss over and we say, oh, well, OK, they go around the outside or they stick together in the middle. So let's move right up to the present day and our current thinking. And all forces, or we think all forces, arise due to the exchange of particles. And these particles just carry some momentum. So let's give you a bit of a picture. Let's take an example of some electrons. We've got one electron here and one electron over here. And this one's heading this way and that one's heading that way. And at some point in the center here, this one repels the one on the left, and off it goes and out that way. And similarly, this one's coming along here, but it's repelled by the one over here and heads off over there. So we call this scattering. And we've got a field. This one develops a field, which then pushes the other particle. Well, that's the field model. But how we believe this really works is as follows. We believe that this one heads this way, emits a photon. So the two particles exchange, the two electrons, sorry, exchange a particle, they exchange a photon in between in this case, although it doesn't have to be a photon. Off goes this photon and it carries some energy with it and it carries some momentum too. And the electron is 
recoil or recoils off its original path. So the photon carries some momentum away and the electron goes back the other way. Uh, so this one ends up going that way. This one, of course, carries on on its original path. Uh, the arrows here don't show the direction of motion, by the way, if this is a Feynman diagram. I might come to that later. But then when that photon's absorbed by this one, it gives the other electron a push and the electron changes direction. So it has exactly the same effect. There is no difference between the effects here. This one is by exchanging a particle in the middle, and the other one is by having fields. Uh, this is how we believe it works. Now, you will notice that repulsion can be easily explained. Probably attraction is not so easy. How can we explain them coming together? Well, you sort of just have to imagine this one throws a boomerang that way, if you like, and then the other one accepts the boomerang. You can get a bit close to it. It is a problem, but just gloss over that bit. We'll hopefully sweep that under the carpet, and we don't worry about it, and you shouldn't either. So, okay, that's the idea of particle exchange. So now let's go for the key point, because we do believe at this point that there are four fundamental forces. I'm going to underline that word fundamental just up here, because there's the strong nuclear, the electromagnetic, the weak nuclear, and gravity. And I've put these in order of decreasing strength here. But those are the four fundamental ones. It turns out that literally every particle leads to a force through the exchange model. And you're going to be used to this. So part of the exchange isn't new. I would almost guarantee that nearly all of you were taught at some point in the distant past, potentially, about exchanging electrons. And if you're a chemist, that's all you ever worry about. All you think is about how atoms exchange electrons. One electron jumps from one to the other, and then these two are bonded together. So you're used to this. If we said exchanging electrons, you say, oh, that's easy. That's just chemistry. Well, all that we're doing is exactly the same thing. So particle exchange, the idea of swapping a particle and this bonding two things together is not new. You've probably met this somewhere else, but in a different guise. So let's just have a look at the four fundamental forces. So the electromagnetic is the one we've just mentioned, and the particle that's exchanged is a photon. It has zero mass and it has an infinite range. So that bit there is fairly well explained. We've then mentioned the strong nuclear. Now, often then the particle which is mentioned for this is the gluon. There's actually eight of those. The common mistake is to think there's nine, but they also have zero mass. Uh, and their range, or the range of the strong nuclear force is often quoted to be about 10 to the minus 15 meters, so about the size of a nucleus. I'm going to come back and we're going to question this in a little while. We then have the other two. There's the weak nuclear. There's actually three different particles which their exchange or swapping these particles results in forces between them. They're not massless, so they've got really, really quite heavy masses. And they also have a very, very short range, even shorter than the strong nuclear force. So these are really sub. Uh, nucleus forces. And then there's the last one. I've put this all in brackets here because we do have the fourth force, which we know exists. It is gravity. But at the moment, there is no uh, coherent theory that puts this into the standard model. So we just ignore gravity. People say that the particle responsible for it is the graviton, the exchange of gravitons. But please note that this has never been detected yet. So at the moment, then we can't really include this. These are fictional particles at the moment, or theorized particles. So this is the stage that we're at. So let's see if we can't explain. Oh, just one more thing here. The strength of these uh, is quite important. So the strong nuclear force, we said it had to be stronger than the electromagnetic. Well, it's about 100 times stronger. The weak nuclear is still actually quite a strong force compared to gravity but it's about 10,000 times weaker than the electromagnetic. And that affects how long these sorts of things take to happen. So strong nuclear interactions happen very, very quickly, as you'd expect, seeing as they're strong. Many, many, many of those can happen in the time for a few of the electromagnetic ones. And then the weak ones take an incredibly long time. Many, many millions of times slower these take place than do strong nuclear uh, interactions and swaps. 
So, okay, we're going to see if we can't explain a bit of this table, and we're going to see if we can calculate a few things. So, first, let's introduce Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And there's two different ways that this uh, can be written. We're going to concentrate on this first one just up here, and I'm going to explain a little bit more about this in a second. Uh, there is a second one just down here, uh, which we would use if we wanted to explain why electrons don't go and stick to the nucleus. So this same principle is going to explain a lot of things. So you'll see that I'm going to disappear for a second because I'm just going to change my document camera and I'm going to swap over onto the document cam. Okay, so I just want to point out a, a couple of things. There's something here which I'm hoping some people have seen. If you haven't, then this is the energy of a photon. Uh, and if it's got frequency f measured in hertz, you multiply it by h. h is a constant. It's called Planck's constant, and it's 6.63 .63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. But the really key thing here is that Energy is proportional to frequency. Now, this isn't just gen. This isn't just true for a photon. When you get a little bit later on, you're going to find that this is more generally true. Uh, I'm going to introduce something else here as well. So this is just a step up into university. If you ever met calculate frequency, I think it's really useful to multiply that by two pi to get omega. We call this the angular frequency, and if you're doing A-level maths or further maths, then you're going to find that this is the same one that you use when you do simple harmonic motion or circular motion. It's going to be measured in radians per second. And if you've got an object, it's going around in a circle like this. So you study circular motion. It goes around here, and we say it moves around at angular velocity omega. This is the same one. It just measures frequency. It's all it is. Measure frequency in hertz, multiply it by 2 pi, and you end up with omega. So this is a much more useful quantity. When you get to university, we use frequency far less often, and we use omega much more often. The other thing that we do is you often use Planck's constant. Well, if you divide that by 2 pi, so by about 6, but then you get 1.05 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And that's called the reduced Planck's constant. We call H bar. So I'm just going to do a couple of things over here. We take the energy uh, of a photon, H times F. If you divide H by 2 pi and you multiply frequency by 2 pi, it works out to be exactly the same. The two just cancel. Or another way to look at this is the energy is h bar omega. This you are going to see lots if you come and study at university. And it crops up an awful lot. So what, what things do I want you to see just here? Well, energy is just frequency, and frequency is just energy. That's the main thing. That's a key thing in particle physics. And now let's imagine that you've got a little wave thing coming along here. Here we go, a little wave frame. That could be like an electron. And let's just see, if you want to measure the energy of this, then what do you need to know? Well, you need to know the frequency. Look, if you want to measure the energy of an electron or of any particle, what you're really interested in is measuring its frequency. Now, how easy is this to do if you have a little electron go by and it takes a little amount of time. Now, don't worry about it having a delta before. It just means time. But what you've got to do is you've got to count, okay, how many peaks go past in that time? That's what you'd need to do to measure the frequency. Frequency is how many full waves go past a fixed point in a second. So let me be clear here. Let me just go back. To measure energy, of something, then you normally need to measure the number of peaks in a fixed period of time. Now you can see here that this is going to be very difficult to do. 
it's not even defined very well. I've drawn this, and there's slightly different gaps between some of these peaks. So it does rather make sense that if something occurs for a really small amount of time, it's going to be hard to measure its energy really accurately because it's going to be hard to measure the frequency. On the other hand, if you've got something which exists for an awful long period of time, and I think you may well do this in your studies as well, if you want to measure the frequency precisely, you're not going to measure one oscillation. You're going to time many oscillations and divide by how many there were, and you'll find the frequency much more precisely. So this just brings me along. This is what I wanted to add here. This is really where Heisenberg's uncertainty principle comes from. It isn't just the difficulty in measuring this. Please don't think it is. It's also the fact that it's not defined very well. But this is Heisenberg's. That's it written down. And let me just explain what this means. So this here. This is the lifetime of, and I'll call it a state, but if you like, you could also call it the lifetime of a particle for today, if you want. And this bit over here, this is the accuracy, if you like. Of knowing its energy. Rather than accuracy, we're going to call it the uncertainty. And what does this show us? Well, this is just a number just over here. We can work that out. I've already said h bar is 1.05 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. So, what does it mean? If something doesn't exist for very long. So that is, if its lifetime is really short, so this number here is really small, we're not going to know its energy very well. This number over here is going to have to be quite big. On the other hand, if the lifetime of something is really long, that is, if it exists for a really long time, so if this number here is really big, then this can be really small. You can know its energy really precisely. All right. So I said that I wanted to do a little bit of this. Well, let's see if we can't. Uh, let's see if we can't do something with hydrogen. So right, here's a hydrogen. We'll have a proton in the middle and an electron around the outside, and we'll have another atom over here, a proton in the middle and an electron around the outside. So if this wasn't clear a minute ago, then usually an example makes it all come alive a bit better. Now, what do we do? We've just said particle exchange binds these two things together. Now, chemists would draw it like this. They draw a hydrogen and a hydrogen, and you'd use a dot and cross diagram. You put two crosses in here to show the electrons. Now, electrons don't sit just there. If you were going to look at this, Two electrons sitting right in between, right next to each other. That's the least likely place that they're going to be. Electrons repel each other. So you would expect one electron to be around one hydrogen and the other one to be around the other. When you draw two crosses next to each other in a dot and cross diagram, that isn't what you're really showing. You're showing that they share those electrons. That's really what you're showing. In reality, then one electron is likely to be over here and the other one's probably here somewhere. But let's just see if we can apply this. And let's see if we can work out how far these need to be before the force is going to pull them together. So what needs to happen? Well, an electron needs to come away from there and head over to the other atom. So what we've done, we've pulled an electron away and we've exchanged it. Now. What have you got to do for that? You've got to pull the electron away first. Now, how much energy does it take to ionize hydrogen? Well, that takes 13.6 electron volts. If you've done any, 
then you'll see that you get energy diagrams and they look a bit like this. And the bot the top one is labeled naught, um, usually electron volts, normally in energy. And the bottom one is usually labeled minus 13.6 electron volts. This is for hydrogen. And what it means is it's how much energy does it take to pull an electron away from a hydrogen atom and pull it completely away. So all right. We've got to pull it away, so ooh, we're going to have to borrow some energy from somewhere. This electron can't just leave. It's bound round here, round it goes. That isn't a very good way to think about it, actually. It doesn't go around in orbits. That's the Bohr model, but it's somewhere around this atom. And to pull it away, we're going to have to find 13.6 electron volts of energy from somewhere. Now, that's a problem, because there isn't that energy anywhere. So we've got we're going to have to be a bit uncertain we're going to have to borrow 13.6 electron volts of energy from somewhere in order to exchange a particle or for this one to come across to here so we know how uncertain we've got to be we've got to be pretty uncertain We've got to give it the chance to borrow this amount of energy from somewhere. So now our next stage is, well, we can say how long it could happen for. So how long could the lifespan of this be? So I'm just going to rearrange this. We've introduced Heisenberg. Just rearrange this in terms of delta T. Well, I bring the uncertainty down to the other side. Actually, I should say here, let's just say it's approximate. It can be about h bar over two lots of the uncertainty in the energy. So let's go. Let's, uh, let's just turn over. I'm just going to do this. I'll just recap exactly what we've got so far. We have two hydrogen atoms. Each one's got an electron bound to it. I've said that so far, when things bind together, the thing that does it is exchanging particles. Well, when you bind two hydrogen atoms together, the thing that's going from one to the other is an electron. And it's a real electron. It already exists. So we're going to have to borrow 13.6 electron volts of energy in order to do that. So how long? can this happen for? Well, it's going to be about h bar over two lots of the energy. We've got a little bit of a, um, a complication because this is not in joules. So I'll worry about that in a minute. We'll convert it to joules. So all right, we've got, if I were to draw this on a diagram, we've got an electron coming in over here. It is going to uh, then traverse over onto the other one over there and we want to know how long when in it going from one hydrogen to the other how long can it last for and therefore how far could it go well we know that speed equals distance traveled over time taken how far could it go we know h bar. We know how much energy it's going to have to just borrow from somewhere. So we can work out how long it can exist for. So if we know how long it can exist for, how far can it go? Well, we, we're not really too sure, but we could certainly get a maximum. So we could rearrange this and we could say the distance traveled is equal to its velocity times its time taken. And what's the fastest it can go? Well, the fastest it could go would be the speed of light. So let's say the range of this force would be approximately equal to. I'll use C for the speed of light. I've already got the change in time or the amount, the lifetime, if you like, of this thing. So I can write an expression just here. The range of the force is approximately the speed of light times the time that it can exist for. We've got that. That's just here. I'm going to pop that in here. CH bar 
over two lots of the energy. All right, now what are we expecting? So we're going to work this out in a minute, and we're just going to see if we've managed to apply something. How big is an atom? Well, they're about 10 to the minus 10 meters. The nucleus is about a 10,000th of that, so that's about 10 to the minus 15 meters. And we're wondering here, how close do two hydrogen atoms have to come in order that they start to bond together? by swapping an electron from one to the other. Well, what are we hoping to get? Well, we're hoping to get something perhaps about like this, perhaps a little bit more. So let's keep our fingers crossed and let's see what we can get. So useful skills for A-level physicists here. We have that the energy we're going to have to borrow from somewhere is 13.6 electron volts. Your first thing to do would be to convert that into joules. And to do that, we multiply by the charge on an electron. So 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. That will convert that to uh, electron volts. So let's just do that. 13.6 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, uh, 2.18. times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Notice that I've used all the decimal places here as well, because we don't want to do anything until the very last line. Now let's see if we can figure out about how far would this need to go. CH bar over 2 delta E. We've got everything that we need. Let's substitute in. Now, if you were at university, we would be encouraging you here to put the units in on everything. So C is the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and leave that in there. H bar, we know, that's 1.05 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And divide the whole lot by two lots of... How uncertain we've got to be in the energy. Well, we've worked that out. We've convert from electron volts to joules. So we'll go uh, 2.176 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Again, equal sign just underneath. Formula first, substitute, and then work out. Now, if you notice here, adding in the units gives you the following things. You can cancel the seconds. Joules divide from top and bottom, and we're going to be left with units of meters. So I've still got that answer from before on my calculator. 3 times 10 to the 8 times 1.05 times 10 to the minus 34. Divide it by 2 and divide it by my answer and let's see what we get. Oh, 7.2. Well, let's go for a 7.2 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. And is that something that we might have expected? Well, uh, I rather hope that it is because We've gone here, we've got 10 to the minus 10. This is 10 to the minus 9. So it's quite reasonable. It's fairly, it's somewhere near the distance or the diameter of an atom. So we want to bring them somewhere close to each other. And certainly this is, uh, this is somewhere in the realms of what we would expect. I'm going to just come here back onto my document cam. Because there's quite a lot. Wait a minute, I'm going to come off my document cam if I can manage to get there. Come on, Dave. Okay, so um, I've sort of done a bit of a calculation. So this was deliberately to bring in a bit of maths and something that would be a little bit more advanced. So we've introduced the uncertainty principle. We've talked about some energy being borrowed from somewhere, which when you swap electrons from two hydrogen atoms is the kind of thing that you need to be thinking. We need to be thinking about borrowing some energy from there. 
So if we were to go on to general particle acceleration, it allows you to calculate how far this force will act across. So going on to general particle exchange. So this is just the kind of thing that we might see. So we have some particle here. It emits some particle in the middle, which is absorbed by another. That's really what pulls two things together. We've just seen it by swapping electrons in a hyd um, hydrogen molecule. Well, it's exactly the same thing that happens between protons and neutrons. It's exactly the same things um, that happen between a proton and an electron that binds it in, that's exchange of photons. So exchanging these particles is all, it's exactly the same principle that we've just had for some electrons. The one thing that's different, and you might want to take this away or we could follow up later um, outside the chat, we would probably look here, I'm just going to skip forward here. The one thing that's different, we borrowed some energy to move that electron from one atom across to the other. And that was 13.6 electron volts. The one thing that's different, I'm just going to scroll past a couple of these. The one thing that's different here is when you're doing some of these, the energy that needs to be borrowed is one to create a new particle. So let me just go up here. Let me just show you here. I'm going to zoom in just on this bit, and then I'm going to stop for questions. When a particle comes along here, and let's say it emits a W minus. So we're talking about the weak nuclear force, and we're thinking, okay, how far could that weak nuclear force act over? You do exactly the same thing we did. But notice what happened here. Imagine that we were this particle flying along. Suddenly, at this point here, You've got your original particle, and you've also now got a W plus. Let's have a look at it. Imagine that we were riding along in a train by the side of this one. We got to this point, and suddenly particle one is now going this way, and we've got this particle over here that's been emitted, the W plus. You've got to create a particle. So that energy that needs to be borrowed is not just the energy to pull an electron away. You've got to create a W minus. So if you wanted to do the same thing again, and we could follow up later, you'd use E equals MC squared, and you could figure out the energy required to generate this particle. And off it goes across to be absorbed a bit later on. OK, We're, I'm going to go to questions, I think, at this point. Um, and people are very welcome to email me later, but we've done quite a few bits of maths in here uh, to try to push it. We've introduced Heisenberg really quickly. So I'll open up to questions, I think, at that point. Yeah, thank you very much, Dave. That was really interesting. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. If somebody has any questions, um, please do put them in the chat. Otherwise, I'll just ask Dave some really tough ones. Um, so for example, uh, where does this uh, photon come from that's exchanged? Say again, Matt. Sorry, yeah, I can't hear you. There. Photon, you know, when these electrons scatter off each other, there's this exchange photon. Uh, if, you, if we want to be really good, I suppose we could do a bit of quantum field theory. So yeah. if you want to go back to fields, for every type of particle, there's a different field. So there is an electron field, there's a photon field, there's a quark field, an up quark field, there's a down quark field, there's a field for every type of particle. Um, the electron comes along, if you like, and then at some point it emits a photon. Um, by where does that photon come from? Then it's just created at that instant in time. The photon didn't exist before it was emitted. Um, and in a quantum field theory, then it, you excite the photon field. There's yeah. a creation of a photon at that point. So it's what um, we call and virtual. then it when it's absorbed. Say again, Matt. It's what we'd call a virtual photon, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, we didn't talk about them being virtual photons. Um, oh, we've got some questions now, so let's let's leave that because that's that's kind of quite advanced stuff. That you know, this idea of virtual photons. Um, so there's a question from Lily. Um, in terms of the fundamental forces, how do they relate to the forces learned about in school, i.e., mm. friction? Well, they relate to gravity. Gravity uh, is obvious. It relates to electromagnetic forces. So you'll learn about fields. One particle creates a field, and then the field pushes on some other particle over here. So that's the model that you'll learn 
in school. You do also, when you get into A-level physics, you do also um, learn about particle exchange. So you do do particle exchange. Um, the electric force actually occurs because photons are swapped between these, um, between these particles. So you do learn about it in school, Lily. Friction is a bit more tricky to explain. It doesn't work in quite the same way. Um, ultimately, it does. So it's a very fundamental level, but put friction in a different box and keep that somewhere different for the yeah. Time. I mean, I mean, the leading kind of idea is that it's to do with the electromagnetic magnetic kind of attraction between um, the charged particles that are kind of rubbing against each other. It's one way of looking at it. Um, yeah. So. Uh, Someone Einstein. called change my name says thanks for the talk. Do you need do you not need a force to transfer a photon to create an electromagnetic force? Is this not an no? Okay, yes. No, creating a photon is not the same as a force. Uh, so two electrons moving this way, we think of them as repelling. What really happens is that one emits a photon and is recoiling, and then the other one absorbs it. And moves out the other way so the force arises because a photon was emitted by one and it was absorbed by the other so no it doesn't need that does einstein play a big part in the discovery of the photon yes i think we have to say yes here um he wasn't the only person who had discussed photons so isaac newton originally thought that light traveled in little packets. He called them corpuscles of light. So he wasn't the first person. He did win his Nobel Prize, Einstein did, for his work on Brownian motion. But it was 1905. It was a really important year. They called it his Annus Mirabilis, I think, his miraculous year. And one of his papers there was the description and explanation of the photoelectric effect. So discovery of the photon he wasn't the only person but he was the person who really explained the photoelectric effect and started the quantum theory moving forward has most of this arised from quantum chromodynamics quantum electrodynamics i think yes and richard feynman uh, i think really put this onto a particular footing quantum chromodynamics is much more complicated um but follows a very similar uh, theoretical background, Brandon. But yes, very, very similar. Yeah. Um, so, as Fabian says, so if you've seen the chat, Fabian is one of our colleagues. He'll be talking tomorrow. He says very nice questions. I, I agree. These are great questions. Uh, so, Dave, you, I think you missed one, David, from another David. Um, how do you know when how do you know? is a particle and when is a wave? Well, I think we could say when the energy of the photon is large compared to the energy of the particles involved, then you've got to consider this as a photon. When the energy of the photon is small compared to some of the other energies involved, then you can consider it as a wave model. Well, yes, it depends on the experimental that? circumstances. Yeah, it depends on mm -hmm. the experiment. Um, yeah. Um, so in the interest of time, I think we're going to um, kind of stop there. But Dave has shared his email address. Um, you can find it on the university website quite easily. So as he said before, please uh, don't hesitate to email him or me uh, with some questions. We'll be very happy to reply. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to Dave. That was really good. Um, thank you for your time. And thank you for uh, the bravery to do it live. That was really good. See, that was a pleasure. Yeah. And, and yes, do follow up with questions. Uh, I'll try to get back to people as best I can. All right. Yeah, so Thanks, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank everyone. You. So what we're going to do now is um, I'm going to play our first um, student interview. So if you just give me one moment. So I'll have to just say the audio on this is not uh, the best, um, but hopefully it's not too bad. OK, so. Uh... OK, so hello. Could you introduce yourselves? Uh, tell us what you did at Lincoln and uh, what you're doing now. Uh, my name's Alec. This is Nick. We both did our BSCs in physics here. We're now doing a research masters at Cambridge. So if you can think back to when you were deciding what to do at university, uh, tell us how you made that choice. Um, it, it was a natural decision, really. I, I mean, I've always loved solving problems and, and kind of physics is, is all about that sort of thing, surprisingly. 
Um, and yeah, I've always enjoyed it at school and I had, I had fantastic teachers when I was younger, so I, I think they're a large part of that decision, but um, I guess I can't speak phallic, but, but that's, that's me. It's really similar to what Nick said, so a lot of the problem solving was really what interested me, but mainly for me it was understanding the fundamentals of the physical world and really physics is the only place that you can, the only subject where you can do that properly. So there were other subjects that interested me like chemistry or engineering, but they don't really get down into the nitty gritty details of the physical world. So how did you end up in Lincoln? Well, so when I was applying, uh, and I, had, I got an offer from Lincoln. Uh, I came for the offer hall today and got given a talk by Marco Pina um, on colloids actually, I still remember it to this day, how interesting it was. Um, and I remember speaking to lecturers of the department and that they were much more interested in me personally than anywhere else that I'd been on, on any kind of open days. Okay. And I still remember that they were asking me kind of personal questions about my interests and why I was interested in physics and these kinds of things that really hadn't happened at any other open days I went to. I'd say that was probably the main reason. And that ended up really showing itself through the close community in the department and the wider university in general. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And um, just, just to add, I mean, you know, being a student is not, not all about studying, you know, the, the city is beautiful and it, I think it does have a very good um, student community and there's always something going on. Um, so yeah, it, it's a very lively city, I think. So what was the, your favourite part of studying physics in Lincoln? I think one of the main things was the really good relationship between the uh, lecturers and the students which kind of makes studying so much easier, you know, you can always you know, ask for help and there was no barrier at all there. So that was really helpful and then, you know, obviously I'm now doing an experimental uh, research master so I enjoyed the lab stuff a lot. Um, it was good fun although it was a lot of work but um, I still enjoyed it. Um, and then also more mathematical subjects like linear algebra I really enjoyed. Okay. Definitely the same with regards to the kind of friendliness of the lecturers and them always being available for, for help that you need on coursework, so just general questions you have about the course or, or any of the course content. Um, but for me personally, I think it's the mathematical content of the course was a lot heavier than most other universities. So a lot of the physics lectures are actually with the math students, which then means that they must be mathematically kind of heavily tailored to them. And I think that that prepared me really well for both my masters and then for PhD applications. So. In my PhD interviews that I did recently, I actually mentioned a lot of my undergrad modules and really used them to almost prove that I did have the mathematical knowledge for theoretical and computational PhD places despite doing an experimental uh, master's. So how did Lincoln prepare you for doing this master's? I'd say for me personally, it was really the theoretical side, so the mathematical side that I mentioned. Um, having all of those maths heavy modules, especially in linear algebra and condensed matter and those kinds of things, really prepared me for the theoretical side of working experimental condensed matter. So although the majority of the actual work that we do today is experimental, there's always room for improvement on the theoretical side. So if you want to improve some core aspect of the microscope, like the source for example, how do you actually generate the beam, um, then you need to really understand the theory behind it. So if the theory is not well understood, which it currently isn't, then you need someone to look into that theory and develop a better model of it. Yeah. And this is really where that mathematical skill comes in. Okay. I think for me, in 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 in, in you know undergraduate labs where you, where you do experiments, they're all kind of set up experiments, but you know as well planned and uh, that as they may may be, there's always something that you know doesn't quite work, and and you know just solving solving the problem on the fly and and kind of thinking up the box, making it work. I think that you know. That, that really prepared me from, for, for what, I, what I do at the moment. So uh, what about your long-term plans, if you have any? Go ahead. Um, so, well, he's mentioned PhDs and interviews before, so we're both definitely going to do a PhD after we finish our master in a couple of months. And then after that, you know, a lecturer once told me, um, you know, before you've done a PhD, you don't really understand fully what you're doing. I mean, when you're doing a PhD you really are kind of exploring the unknown and, and you really learn, you know, you have to solve all, all problems on your own really. Yeah. And the, the skills that you learn from that, they can be applied to all sorts of 
um, jobs in, in industry or, or um, you know become an academic. I, to be honest, I'm not. I haven't quite decided what's, what what I'm going to do, but um, it's definitely going to be in the kind of technological sector, and, and but we will have to do something with physics or engineering or something like that. Okay, so still undecided. Yeah. I think Nick has really said it all, but the only thing that I can add is that um, that's kind of why we've chosen a research master's, is to get a taste of PhD life. So we've spent basically now nearly 12 months doing just research in the same exact way day to day that you would a PhD. Yeah. And that's kind of the easiest way to find out whether it's for you. That's how we've ended up coming to, to settle on doing a PhD for sure and not going and getting a graduate. Okay, so what were your favourite modules? I think from, from the taught modules, I think I, I, I must play linear algebra, Hamiltonian and um, Lagrangian mechanics, along with the um, condensed matter, which is a lot what I get to do now. Um, yeah, I think that would be my three top modules. I think linear algebra for me is, is top one or two, and then quantum mechanics is, all, is probably the other one. Um, at the time when we were doing it, it was taught by Bart, who amazingly managed to explain some very difficult concepts to us, um, which certainly not every quantum lecturer can do as well as he did. So, what did you do for your third year project? So, my project was an experimental project. I was coaching dental implants to, with the aim to introduce, induce antimicrobial properties. And I coded them using PVD, so physical vapor deposition, which is quite an um, advanced technique. And um, yeah, it was really cool working with that. And um, the, all the techniques I used to analyze the films that I um, sputtered onto um, various surfaces, um, they really helped me a lot in my um, in my, P or my master that I'm doing right now, especially the, you know, using the SEM on a kind of daily basis and, um, you know, some of the harness testing I was doing is also quite new to me, so just doing something new I'd never done before really kind of helped um, in, what, in, in what I do now, so. What my thesis you? was titled The Geometric View of Electromagnetism and my supervisor was Fabian. Um, it was purely theoretical, no conversational or, or practical elements to it at all. Um, really what I enjoyed most about it was the chance, the freedom that I had to go into a topic really in depth, kind of even further yeah. than a graduate module would take you. Um, the topic itself was basically investigating whether tensors or differential forms were the more natural expression of electromagnetism um, from a geometric perspective. So meaning, since you're trying to represent fields, how would you most naturally represent those? So with tensors, it's kind of like using effectively vectors, but big boy vectors. And then with differential forms, it's using surfaces. So the intuition is that surfaces might be the more natural, but that's not what's typically taught at university until you get to a much higher level, even to the end of Masters, it's usually not taught that those can actually be used. Um, this is something that I changed about my project actually, that wasn't the original path of the project at all to do this comparison. The differential forms came in from uh, these extracurricular study groups that we did with some of the lecturers uh, that both of us went to, where we were working through basically a book called Gravitation, um, looking at really the beginnings of general relativity, kind of working up towards it. We didn't get that far, sadly but the basis was there and we didn't look at differential forms in that context and that's kind of something I wanted to include and got really interested in, so I included it in my third year project. Okay, so that was the first um, of our alumni interviews so uh, uh, Nick and Alec visited us, visited us last week, so we recorded that last week uh, with the windows open, so that's why the sound was not great. Uh, all the other ones will be higher quality than that. Um, so now it's uh, nearly 10 o'clock, so I'm joined now by Manuela uh, Mora. Hello. She's a senior lecturer in the School of Maths and Physics. And so Manuela teaches electrodynamics in the second year. Uh, in which you will use a lot of vectors and stuff. Yes, uh, it's mostly the, yeah, the yeah. main <laughs> outcome, yes. So Manuel is going to talk about vectors and use yeah. Python to explore vectors. So Manuel, you sent me a link. Um, yes, uh, 
it's a kid if you can put on the chat, put, essentially. Put the chat. The, so if you uh, already have um is it anaconda yes if you can um, install uh, we're going uh, through the talks how to install as well or you can have uh, another uh, uh web uh, link that is the uh, binder one so you can use uh, jupyter uh, uh, a notebook online as well but we will do on during the talk yeah how so, to install yeah so Manuel's going to talk about this in the talk but i've just put the link in the chat um so if you happen to have these things already installed if you're already kind of proficient with python and stuff yeah um, you can open that link and kind of play along so to speak um, but it's not necessary you can just watch and uh, maybe yeah. try later on uh, you know when you have time um so manuela uh, over to you Yes, let's start to share screen. Uh, yes, great. Okay. Here we go. Can you yeah. see this right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so. I'll, uh, okay, over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Alec and Nick actually gave me a good uh, assist to start to talk about vectors because they did uh, this uh, alec did the project in uh, geometric overview of uh, electromagnetism so because i'm teaching electrodynamics uh, quite a lot i have problems with the students because uh, visualize and um, uh, describe a vector field is sometimes quite complicated if you have any question you can uh, contact me using the website the my email address sorry uh, so the structure of the talk is quite simple. So we're going a very short overview about vectors, and then we just talk a little bit about Python, and then I go straight away with the exercise, trying to do the best uh, for everyone. Um, as you know, uh, the first step is what is a vector? Probably you're already aware of the concept of vector. And vector is essentially a mathematic quantity that is defined by a, a magnitude that is the length of my uh, line and direction that is represented by the arrow. As, um, and uh, because it's a mathematic quantity, um, we can use uh, quite a lot of mathematics to describe this uh, object. So what I want to focus is how do we represent a vector? So, uh, we know that has a, a direction and a magnitude, and uh, but the representation of vector can be several. So we can have a graphical representation as the one that I just showed you a few minutes ago, and or we can describe everything, uh, define the magnitude, the direction, or talk about in terms of component. And the part of the component is quite important because it links to one part of mathematics that is uh, can be linked to electrodynamics. So the graphic representation is uh, the one, as I said, as I showed before, this arrow, where this can be a force. We have a, a point, a starting point, and a particular direction and the magnitude. So everything can be easily uh, reconducted to frame of references. So if we have a Cartesian axis, as you know, we just put uh, it make it in such a way that the origin of the vector is the same as the origin of my uh, frame of references. And uh, we know that in this case, we can define essentially the main bit that we can define is the angle that my vector form a, a, against the x axis. And that is I open a new dif different perspective in description of vectors because now we have uh, the magnitude, but we have also have this angle. So that uh, allowed us to talk about vector in terms of components. So um, using the sum of vector, we can always write uh, this vector f as the sum of two vectors. One is fx, that is the vector that is parallel to the x direction and point toward right, and is called fx. And the sum we're summing with fy, that is the vector that is parallel to y and essentially pointed toward up. In this, thanks to this, we can rewrite the, the vector as a sum of two, two vectors. And using our trigonometric uh, knowledge, 
we can usually describe essentially effects in terms of magnitude, a cosine of theta, or magnitude, a sine of theta. And this open a new overview and essentially can be linked uh, to matrices because the next step is write my vector as essentially a vector a column where the first row is essentially the component of x and the second row is the component of y. Uh, because I can talk uh, in terms of uh, uh, vectors or in uh, internal linear uh, matrix, so this is essentially a column, uh, we can also use uh, this concept to uh, link to our programs, so we talk about arrays. So the reason why I'm essentially talking about vector is because uh, vectors have uh, a large application in mathematics. There is uh, several branch of mathematics that treat uh, vectors and they base uh, on notion of vectors. There is, uh, uh, as Nick and Alec talk, they talk about linear algebra, that's essentially what you usually do when you do feather math with when you work with matrices and mainly describe spaces but also as a, a huge important in physics and engineers so uh, when we talk about mechanics or even electricity we do always have to do with forces electromagnetic force electric field magnetic field and so on um, in computer science is the mathematic uh, uh, conception of uh, a vector that is used to, for example, uh, generate image, uh, rearrange, um, I don't know, even a computer graphic now use a lot of uh, information about uh, what is called uh, vectors uh, uh, projections. So, now that I give you this very short introduction, we can say something about what I want to show you. So the, we do some uh, basic exercise. Essentially, we will try show you how to write uh, a vector in Python that is mostly to familiarize yourself with the code. And then we do some exercise on some of uh, two vectors, dot product that are some simple as uh, add a operation with vectors, and then uh, we will plot some uh, vectors. Um, as a main language of program, I use in Python. And the reason why I use Python is because one, it's free, it's open source, and usually everyone likes open source. The fact that it's open source allowed a large number of people to have uh, assessed the code, so that uh, allowed uh, to create a large community that share and develop uh, codes and also create large section of library that were very used uh, there at the moment used for application in mathematics, physics, but also computer science, uh, physics, medical physics and everything that has to do also with uh, email processing. As well, uh, from a, a career point of view, uh, the, um, uh, Python is one of the most popular um, uh, programs that are searched uh, worldwide. So it's essentially very important to know a language of pro programming languaging, and Python is one of the most popular, either in research, either in in industry. So, well, so once I have uh, give you uh, some uh, short introduction about Python, I just tell you what kind of Python use. There are several kind of interface for Python, and what the one that I use is called a Jupyter Notebook. Um, I use a Jupyter Notebook because it's very nice interface. But uh, I can tell you some short. Um, instruction if you want to install. Essentially, if you want to install into your, your program, you can type on Google, install Anaconda. That is essentially the website where you can do. Uh, and then you can install the program depending if you have a Linux, a Windows, or Mac computer. Or if you want, there are several online tools. Again, uh, if you type Jupyter Notebook online, you will be able to see to find that this uh, Jupyter Lab, and then uh, you will have a similar interface. Then you can upload this file that is the one that hopefully Matt upload on the chat, and then we can work together if you want. 
So next slide is mostly about how Jupyter Notebook looks like. As, as I said, it's very nice interface. And as uh, the um, advantage that uh, you can type test using this cell mark markdown, and essentially allowed you to input uh, uh, text in HTML. So you can create like a web, uh, web page quite complicated, plus you can add uh, your code cell so it just uh, it's very nice as interface you can create a very good web page and uh, you can share your uh, object um, python itself has uh, five main objects that are numbers that we can use they are integer float long integer and complex numbers and also without uh, up, uh, loading anything, we can do simple uh, operations that are essentially the one that I list here. If we want to do something a little more complex with Python, we just use, uh, we need to load the library that we, I was discussing before. And there are several kinds of libraries that you can use. But in this particular case, we get, we use two main uh, libraries. One is uh, uh, called NumPy numerical Python, that is essentially uh, one, uh, it's a list of uh, function or instruction that allowed to uh, manipulate complex mathematics objects like, like, for example, um, arrays, matrices, uh, add, uh, and do more or less uh, more complicated uh, uh, um, mathematical operation with the uh, uh, then adding or uh, subtracting uh, vectors. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more, I just put the link of NumPy there. You will see there are a lot of samples, a lot of uh, as I said that you can try to do if you want. Uh, the next second uh, library that I'm going to use is matplotlib. Again, that is uh, uh, something that I need to plot the the vectors. So. Um, this uh, create to, uh, to allow you to create uh, data points, lines, and uh, also animation. Again, if you go to the website, that is matplotlib.org, you will see that there are um, a lot of examples and uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, objects that are, are interesting to plot, are interested to be plot. Um, so this part is also taught uh, in... Uh, uh, Python is also taught in uh, our first year during uh, our professional skill group study, but also in stats. So we do use Python to uh, do that. But now, now essentially, with the, that the, my introduction part go start finish, what we can do is just uh, I can show you how to slide quickly install Python if you want and uh, how to start doing the exercise. Hopefully this part will be more interesting. So as I said, I just uh, the type Jupyter Notebook Online, and uh, you can see there is this, uh, let's put, I mean, Jupyter Notebook, that is an interface that allowed you to train on your logbook, and you will see this kind of video, and then we use Jupyter Lab. And that allows you to work without any kind of, uh, without install any kind of uh, uh, Python. If you already have a Python in your computer, uh, it's okay. You can use it. No, uh, there is no problem. You can use it. Um, the other option is to install Anaconda. Again, type install Anaconda. And then there is uh, installation documentation. And you can install, decide to install one of the three package. Um, the Anaconda package looks exactly like the uh, video that I showed you before. And here, in, if I click Python, I will show you how it is my Jupyter notebook. And uh, the link that uh, hopefully is uh, I used before, you can upload the file using this uh, tab here, and then uh, upload uh, is in download. Um, now it's complicated, sorry for that. So you can select the, the file that you need, and then you get the notebook as you is. Uh, yes, I need to click on it twice. First, I'll upload, and then you need to 
click twice. So let's start with the question. So as I said, then what we have to do is just how to represent the vector. So uh, one initial thing that uh, I ask myself is how I want to uh, create a vector using NumPy. And here uh, there is essentially the question. So we got a list of number that is one, two, three, simple. And uh, I want to use NumPy to create a vector, horizontal vector, that is a vector row, and uh, a vertical vector that is a vector column. So this first exercise will be the essentially background of your uh, next question. So it's just, uh, it just to warm up a little bit and see how this work, okay? So let's start. So the first, uh, I have some suggestion that uh, can be used. So insert uh, the correct library, in this case, NumPy. And so in order to in use NumPy, I need to type import NumPy as NP. So that implies that everything that comes after uh, NumPy, all the function that I use uh, with NumPy will be called NumPy dot something, numpy.arrays, numpy.calculation, uh, or something like that. Uh, the second suggestion is create a list of for the horizontal vector. So Python has, uh, is a very powerful because you can create several kinds of lists. And again, they are already implicit in the program itself. But the list essentially is a kind of container with the numbers. So I define the variable list one, that is uh, how I define my variable, that has to be equal to uh, the number one to three, and I use uh, to define the number one to three, the square bracket and a comma between the three. So that is how I define my first list, right? And if I want to print or visualize my list, I just need to print do type print list one, and then I run. It takes a little one, and then I essentially we got exactly the same kind of list. Um, I used this symbol to create uh, a comment out the object. And uh, the second part essentially asked me to create uh, the horizontal vector. And how do we create the horizontal vector is essentially using what is called and the array. So I just want to create an array of using this list. And to do that, I just call vector one, my new variable vector one, that is the vector that I'm going to use. I just use the common NP array. Uh, and I, and then applied to my list of numbers. That essentially allowed me to create to uh, give uh, Python the possibility to read the vector as array. And then I print my vector one. Let's see. And uh, as you can see, good time. So the, now I got uh, essentially a column where uh, the commas between the numbers is finished. It's not uh, anymore there. And so I got uh, a vector. I can do the same exact work with the list two. In this case, I just list uh, define this two, and I define slightly different the object calling one, two, and three. Essentially, each one of these uh, uh, square bracket or three, sorry, represent uh, my col uh, my row. It's like uh, I'm creating uh, a row column where each one of these numbers are my in, my, in my column, where each one of these numbers are rows. And if I do a print list to one, two, what I see, I don't see much different from the previous case because it prints as it reads. And then again, I need to make create an array. array. of list. Uh, sorry, I'm very bad at typing. Um, and then uh, if I take time, uh, yeah, I didn't ask uh, the print, the vector two. And then we got essentially 
something that is in a vertical direction. So that was the first step of my question. The next step is adding two vectors together. And uh, so um, in this case, given the two vectors, A1, A2, A, B, we, what we want to do is just to write a short uh, program to calculate the arithmetic operation like addition or subtraction. So again, um, all this uh, program that we used before can be used again. So what I do is just take, I light the program, control C to copy, and then control V to paste, right? The vector one is again one, two, three, and the vector two in this case uh, is not a vector column, but it will be two, uh, three, and four, so it's uh, again my column, a uh, yes a square. And what I'd want to do now is just define a, a, a new vector that I call vector uh, three, that essentially is the sum of vector one plus vector two. Uh, just uh, for your information, I just uh, let I want to remind you that uh, if, when we add two vectors together, essentially we are adding the same component. So we do one plus two, two plus three, and three plus four, and that is uh, a reminder for how to work. So now uh, I need just to put the uh, my vector addition. And then essentially I close this, this I close the string, uh, comma, and then vector. Mm, if I write properly vector three, and then if I run, essentially I got two, three, and four. Uh, this ah uh, okay. Doesn't work. There is something. We, ah, okay. Three, five, or seven. So I, I was just confused. So that is my vector addition. Okay. Um, if I do want to do a dot product again uh, for Python, I use a special function that is called dot, and uh, it's again uh, if I just use. Uh, let's assume that we're using the same program as before. And then I just want to remind you that when we do the dot product, we just do uh, element, the element, uh, likewise element. So A1 multiplied by B1, B A2 multiplied by B2, and A3 multiplied by, by B3. And that is a, a, a product that give me the product between the two vectors that uh, give me essentially the scalar vector itself. Again, I, if I print this object, dot, dot, and uh, comma again dot underscore vector product. I essentially can visualize that unless, uh, okay, but I didn't misspell print. So we got 20. So we got one multiplied by two, two, two multiplied by three, six, so two, eight, three multiplied by four, 12, eight plus 12, 20. So we got the right product. product. So that was just mostly to warm out and warm up and just to understand that how uh, dot product uh, and our vector works with Python. The other thing that is a kind of cool that I want to show you is how to plot these vectors, right? Again, if you go around, if you go search online, you can find several methods to plot. But uh, um, so the first thing is we got uh, a vector that uh, is uh, um, two and three, so we use matplotlib. So as before, we need to import a NumPy to define 
uh, the mathematic property. This example are quite simple, but uh, um, usually we can we need the NumPy to do a little more sophisticated object. So the libraries are again NumPy, and I import my plotlib.pplot as plt. So again, as before, everything will start plt. Dot blah blah blah. And uh, this line usually is need uh, because uh, every time I don't import, I need uh, and the program doesn't work. Uh, so the first thing that I do is just to set the box where I want to plot my object. And I do this importing this figure uh, property and this axe property. As you can see, I am using the function plt.subplot that essentially define my plot and the sides. So again, if I run now the, my program, I will see an empty box. So that is one interesting thing. The other bit that I made want to do is just define the axis. So the axis limit is. So I just define uh, my box between minus one and four for x and minus one and four for y. Again, if I run again the object, I as you can see, my limits are between minus one and four and minus one and four. Um, so how do we define the vector? So it's very similar to what we did before. So if I call vector, this object, that is essentially another way to, so my x and y, that in this case, essentially two and three, and then I define easily my vector. That would be my vector. To plot the vector, what I'm using is this function ax annotate that essentially reads the vector uh, that I define here, 2, 3, and then start from 0, 0 and use an arrow to uh, and essentially plot the arrow. Most of the uh, instruction here are related to how I uh, formatted the, the arrow. So, whoop, yay. Uh, yes, I forgot the equals here. So now we got uh, uh, my arrow, right? And then uh, that is a simple representation of my vector. I can improve uh, this uh, plot uh, using uh, several, uh, um, in essentially adding uh, the text and uh, um, object that can make my plot a little more efficient, but also Essentially, add the X and Y uh, label, but also I can essentially insert, create a plot very similar to what I show you in the slide, inserting uh, this function spine. And the function spine is essentially a very similar, works very similarly to what uh, usually, uh, how the, the box of uh, essentially the Excel uh, cell works. So it's just uh, decide to switch on and switch off uh, particularly particular kinds, uh, lines on this box. So I just uh, define the left at the bottom and I ask to set the position to zero. So what I'm expecting that these, these lines will move between zero and zero. So we will center as before. And then I essentially remove the right and the top. If I run again, I exactly got my vector that is a center in zero zero so this is a very simple representation but we can with Python we can use it different ways and the next question next exercise essentially is using quiver method to to plot a, a ve the vectors two vectors actually and now I'm just to cut and paste the uh, the the code on here, and then I will tell you what is up, what is going on. So this quiver is essentially a very nice function in Python, and then, as I say, can show us a very similar characteristic as before. I did use PLT grid, so this one shows the grid as well. So as usually, what we need as a library is again a NumPy as MP, Matplotlib PLT. And then uh, all the characteristics to define my box. 
Um, in order to use uh, quiver, we need to define the initial position that in this case are two vectors. So we define the initial position for the x vector and the initial position for the y vector that is 0, 0, 0, 0. And then we define the directions that are 2 and 3 and 0 and 2. When we use, we want to plot, you just use this function ax.quiver that uh, uh, needs to define the initial position, the initial position of x, the initial position of y, and the direction, right? And then the scale. And um, when, again, these all are all uh, bits that are used to make a little more uh, visual my, my plot. And then what I said, it's just to show the two vectors that are not uh, in x and y. Um, so that was simple, but the, the nice thing about this method is that we can plot a vector field. So uh, the next example essentially use the same kind of uh, quiver method to visualize this vector field that is 3 high minus 5 high. These are numbers, so that will uh, means that you will expect for each point of the space the same uh, the same vector, so it's a constant vector field. Um, so I hope it's uh, we can you can um, essentially you can use easily what we did before to uh, the code that we did before to start. And again, we need the, the matplotlib that are uh, the one that I cut and paste here, and then the size. And the world, yeah. And then um, again, it is slightly different uh, orientation. So these are again the labels for my x and y axis. I, in this case, what I want to do, I want to associate, create a plot that for each point of the space in the grid between minus two and five, minus two and five, assign a vector. So. Uh, again, this is just mostly color or life, and then this is my vector u and three, and then you, I use again plt.quiver to define the initial position that is given by the mesh grid, and uv that are uh, three and minus five defined by my vector field, and I want to plot in green. So I run it, and uh, as you can see, what we get is essentially a very nice plot where we have the same vector of vector field if you want for each point of my grid. And that is very nice because if the SSI is a little more complicated, uh, we can essentially visualize in a, a more sophisticated uh, um, vector fields using instead of numbers, essentially equations. And that's what we will see later on, hopefully. Um, same kind of method that can be used at the in three dimensions. And again, also in this case, we just use uh, a quiver method. But of course, now instead of we we not have to use only uh, matplotlib, but we need to use another library that allowed us to visualize the uh, three dimensions. And this particular library is called it's from. MPL toolkits, essentially dot map plot 3D import axis 3D. But the structure that we want to use is exactly the same. Again, we needed to create it in my box to visualize the plot. Again, create a grid because I want to see how the vector change in different points. Reality. Uh, and then in the origin, and then create the direction, and then works exactly in the same exact way. Oops, it doesn't work. Maybe I forgot something. Uh, maybe. Let me change this in some. Uh, ah, yes, because there were two things. So, so that is the vectors in three dimensions. 
if you want a little bit though a little more complicated um, again in matplotlib you can find another example with a gallery where essentially we do have uh, quiver 3d and that is uh, very nice and with a very quite sophisticated kind of uh, um, random distribution. So, because I want to do several uh, plots to the, my um, force field in a no force field, yes, a vector field in a different uh, a different point. So again, I want to visualize a grid that in this case in three dimension because I'm doing next one z. And here we got to three vectors, and uh, we don't have any more uh, simple numbers, but these are essentially mathematics function, and that is a combination of sine and cosines. And then we do have a very random distribution of uh, uh, vectors like this one. Um, the next example, again, is using uh, a little more of another quiver methods. And I want to show you this because uh, is uh, um, from my point of view, is interesting because uh, it's very similar to the previous one where we use the arrows like that, but instead of use the values u and v equal to um, three and five, we just use uh, x over five, x over uh, y over five. So essentially what I can do is just, I can, uh, no, I can copy this. Uh, no, because I need to do insert. Ah, yes, I can do that. I can copy this code here, right? And uh, change you with you this putting x divide five and y divide five. And then run again a code. We will see that essentially we get different kind of lines. Um, in this case, and then we can change, for example, also the the, uh, the mesh grid. So we can change the interval that we want to analyze. And then we can see a more interesting object than this. Uh, we can increase the number of points that we want to see. So the number of vector fields that we want to visualize. And then essentially it's quite, uh, I don't know. I think it's very, very, very interesting. Um, and on the same, uh, the next exercise that we don't really have much time to do it because I want to, uh, are essentially mostly uh, working with the same kind of codes uh, and uh, generate uh, the object um, in, a, in a simpler way. So uh, for the example 10, where we have essentially the vectors in this case, if I just plotting a radio. And this is a, just a simple two dimension plot. So we will, the next example 10 is just the two dimensional plot using the same method um, and essentially plotting and showing how the, uh, the intensity, the magnitude of the arrow change depending on the points. And we can, uh, do exactly the same kind of object in three dimension. That is the example number 11. The final exercise that maybe it's worth to have an uh, overview of, it's uh, um, asked to essentially write the code to produce the plot of electric field generated by electric dipole. This is a, essentially an example of a book that is also available online, at least this is for me. And uh, it's uh, dipoles, as you know, probably is just a positive and negative charge in a, in a, a distance t. And then uh, we just use it to create uh, the force, the line force of uh, the dipole. And uh, the code is the following. Again, you can go there and have a look. Um, and uh, essentially, it does work without uh, even the uh, quite simply using 
uh, a mesh grid of X and Y. Again, we define the range in X and Y. We define the mesh grid because we want, again, visualize for each point in the space. And then we define my electric field in X, electric field in Y, and that is this one. Ask to plot the figure and then ask to use this stream plot uh, X, Y, E, X, X, Y, and with a particular definition. What we will see is, if it works, it takes a little longer to run, ah, I was there. So it's essentially the point red and green where the positive and negative charge are located or, or north and south pole are located. And all the rest essentially show you uh, point by point how the uh, force, the field, the vector field changes accordingly with the uh, vector. So I hope I show you interesting things. So the idea was mostly to uh, use Python to um, show you how to plot the, uh, the vectors but also try to see show you that python is not a particularly difficult uh, program you can try there is a lot of uh, uh, example and if you come uh, essentially to across with uh, our university you will be able to uh, use largely okay i hope thank you for uh, your attention i'm slightly hopefully on time and uh, no, that was beyond sense that's good uh, so yeah, thank you very much, Mario. That was uh, really, really uh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, so please um, put on your questions on the uh, chat. We'll see them and we'll try and answer them. Ah. Um, but uh, in the meantime, while we're waiting for questions, um, I guess I, I imagine people watching, especially if they're doing A levels, probably haven't seen vector fields before. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'm wondering if you could maybe say a little bit more about you know what they are, kind of how they're useful in physics. Um, I can say that uh, as essentially vector field, it's uh, everything starts with the definition of uh, electric field, for example, or essentially. And uh, is the idea that we can uh, measure the electric field independently from uh, a chart, but just uh, according, depend on the position of the geometry that you are, you can feel uh, measure the electric field in some way, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that essentially it's uh, mostly linked to the definition of electric field for uh, electromagnetic, uh, electrodynamic point of view, but mostly is very similar to what I showed you before. Essentially, it's the idea that for each point of this plot, we can measure an uh, associated vector and we know exactly what is the magnitude and the direction of that vector. And from there, we can do a lot of uh, speculation about energy, potential, and uh, what uh, a charge object to do in that kind of position and so on. Exactly. We can yeah. say a lot of information about uh, the equilibrium position as well. OK, we do. We can say a lot, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I find it quite interesting, actually. I don't know if you could hear in that interview with Nick and Alec, yeah. And so the audio was, we had the window open for safety reasons and all this stuff. So the audio wasn't great. Um, but they both said their favorite module was linear algebra. Yes, I was very Which good. is a maths, so, a maths module they do in the first year where you learn about vectors um, just from a mathematical perspective. Um, and then we use it in second year, for example. Manuel uses it. Quite uh, I, 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 to be fair, I love linear algebra as well because uh, it's, uh, uh, it gives you, I don't know, it gives you a very interesting point of view on uh, the geometric perspective. It's linked the very uh, uh, solid mathematical background with uh, your uh, geometric point of view. It, yes, can be used everywhere because when you talk about how Higgin value or second vector essentially has uh, infinite application in finance, in uh, energy physics, and uh, anything uh, that is related but yes it's i think as well that is one of the best modules on university but i find it interesting that the physicists found it their favorite module um, so yeah, yeah, yeah like i said you linear algebra this kind of stuff with vectors is very important uh, even when you get to quantum mechanics yeah, yeah. yes 
So I guess one last question is, would you encourage um, all people watching who are interested in going to study maths and physics to kind of learn programming? Uh, yes, I, I will say yes. I know that is painful and uh, I'm not particularly fun as well uh, on the programming side, but uh, it kind of uh, open your mind. It just uh, give you a different perspective in terms of uh, visualizing things and maybe helps you to understand uh, some uh, complicated concept that uh, sometimes uh, very abstract that's yeah. it's my opinion but also you use it quite a lot in, in research as well right yeah yes 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 i'm a computational physics of course yeah. yes yes so yes i use it quite a lot yes so it's quite useful because nowadays you know to, to do really good experiments or at least um, not not necessarily but a lot of the experiments are done with really expensive equipment you know you need a lot of funding to do meaningful yeah. experiments in a lot of areas of physics um, but you can do simulations on a computer much more uh, uh, quickly. I, I, I was about to say easily, but that's not necessarily true. But, uh, yeah, yeah, no, quickly sometimes, but sometimes no, because of interpret, understand the results is always difficult, right? Yeah. That's also so, funny. Okay. So it doesn't seem there's any questions from the audience, um, so, but that's okay, that's fine. Um, so we're kind of out of time anyway. Yeah. yeah so I think actually now we're going to show the interview with Flick, which you actually just did yourself. Yes. Yes. So I'm going to find that and play that. Okay. Just give me one second. And I think it's quite short, so we'll actually have quite a bit of a, maybe a almost 10 minute break, not quite, maybe five, six, seven minute break um, before the next talk at 11. So that'll give you a chance to go and get a cup of tea or something. Uh, just give me one second. Okay, so thank you very much, Manuel. Thank you. That was, uh, thank you. Really good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Hello everyone, today we are here with one special guest, she is Flick, is one of our former students, and please Flick, tell us something about you, introduce yourself. So, hi, as you said, I'm Flick, and how would I describe myself? Uh, I'm, I like football, okay. <laughs> um, that's probably something I like. Um, and I have two guinea pigs that are essentially my new children called Aurora and Mare. So you can kind of understand what kind of person I am from that. Okay, maybe. <laughs> um, so this uh, interview is mostly to give uh, a direction to students that are going to decide for the degree. So how did you decide to go in physics and do your degree? <laughs> Uh, I probably came in a different way into physics. Um, so I went through high school and I loved physics out of all the sciences. And then I went to A levels and I absolutely flopped. Uh, I failed physics the first year. And so when it came to deciding what to do with my second year, I basically said, no, I'm going to have another stab at it. And I took A level maths. Um, and then I passed that and got to decide what to do at uni. And I originally applied for geology at Kiel, <laughs> got accepted into that. And on results day, um, yeah, I changed my mind. I was like, no, I actually want to do physics. Um, and phoned, I phoned Kiel, told him to give my place to someone else and phoned Lincoln and got onto the physics course there. Okay, but quite interesting uh, fact. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, so, how I ask you a question, how studying at university compare with you with your expectation before starting? Weirdly, I found uni a lot more supportive than my A levels. Like I think A levels is such a huge jump. Like to go from high school to A levels is such a huge jump. And then when it goes from A level to uni, it's, it's tiny. And that sounds really odd. You'd think it'd be the opposite, but it's it's so much nicer coming into uni and you start off in first year kind of just re-going over your A-levels so you feel much more comfortable and then building on top of that. Um, so obviously high school people don't be offended when you get to A-levels and it looks crazy um, because if you do take it at uni, it's, it's a lot easier and it's more just easier to get on, <laughs> on track with it. Um, yeah, I thought it would be harder. Um, it was really hard. I don't think I'm saying it's easy. Um, but it's just, it's a little step instead of like the big step. Okay. And uh, what was the most interesting part of your degree? <laughs> Marco will love this. <laughs> but I probably would say one of my favourite bits was labs. 
and that's only because it wasn't quite like a solo thing to do like you have lab partners or lab groups and I really enjoyed the social aspect of it uh one of probably the most memorable moments would be Christmas and playing Christmas songs in the lab by trying to convince Marco to let us do it one of the best Christmases ever <laughs> managed to get people in Christmas jumpers it was great so yeah labs is probably one of the best things about it okay this year we didn't have they didn't have uh, labs uh, Christmas in the <laughs> lab <laughs> 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 um, next question is uh, would you recommend to study at the University of Lincoln uh, 100%. Uh, I love Lincoln. Uh, I'd like to say I still do, but I don't live there anymore. Uh, I love Lincoln. I love the environment. I love like, I love my lecturers. <laughs> uh, just because if I ever needed any help, I could literally knock on any door and there'd be someone that'd be willing to kind of give me a hand. And like, I think that's so rare to get, especially if you're, you struggle like me. I learn a lot better if someone sits with me, explains it and treats me like an absolute baby and walks me through it step by step. And I couldn't name a single lecture that wouldn't do that at Lincoln. Um, so, yeah, highly recommend it. Okay, thank you. And um, so the la last question is, uh, what are you doing now? What is... Uh... Uh, I, what kind of I would uh, love to say I was doing something physics related. Uh, my manager, who done a PhD in physics, would also like to say that I've done physics in my job, but I don't. Uh, I'm currently a project manager at BAE Systems Applied Intelligence at Guildford. Um, uh, what do I do? I essentially just run projects that are worth the, a few million, when I say a few million, about 10 million pounds at the moment. Um, and I do that. Excel sheet essentially. So uh take note of that first year module that ran for about a month <laughs> on how to do Excel because that comes in it does come in really handy and you'll be surprised that when you get into the future how many people just <laughs> use Excel. <laughs> um so yeah, that's all I do and I just chat to people. So I managed to use my degree because I went on a grad scheme with them. So that's how I got into the job and I got an interview rather than physics specific. So it did come in useful to get to where I am now. <laughs> okay. So um, the one last question is about uh, maybe, uh, as you know, most a lot of students undergrad, no undergrad, I, I level students do, don't, do not know what to do, uh, what kind of path to choose, or what uh, university to choose. So maybe if you can give them some, I don't know, hints or some suggestion how to choose the right university for them. So uh, I probably am quite, yeah, it's brave to say it now because I've done it, so I don't really have that pressure that they have. Um, it's important in A-levels you pick something that you enjoy and you hear that time and time and again. Don't force yourself to do a degree that you're not going to enjoy because you'll hate your life because your life is literally that one subject. And if you hate it, then that's it. You won't stay at uni uh, because uni is a huge jump in itself. If you've got to move miles and miles away from your friends and family, you've got to love what you do. Otherwise, it's going to be lonely and sad. So <laughs> make sure you do what you like um, and just kind of in, enjoy it. So. I would obviously recommend doing a STEM subject um, because most companies now will usually lean towards hiring a STEM graduate. Um, so that would just open a few more doors for you if you do STEM rather than uh, an, another degree. Um, so if, <laughs> the best advice, <laughs> like it and yeah, STEM if you can. <laughs> it's a good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Click. <laughs> I hope. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution and uh, see you soon. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, so that was a good interview. Uh, some good advice there at the end, I think. And it always makes me smile when students say their favourite subject was lab. That's good. Um, so what we can do now is um, I'll put on the schedule for the rest of the day. I'll um, remove myself. And uh, we can have a five minute break. Okay, so we'll be up, we'll be back at eleven with Phil Sutton, who will be talking about exoplanets and stuff. So please take a five minute break and I'll see you soon.
Okay, so hello, we're, we're back. Um, let me get the background. So uh, I'm here with, now with Phil Sutton. He's a lecturer in the School of Maths and Physics. He's our, resident, yep. he's, our, he's our resident expert in astrophysics and astronomy. Um, and he's going to talk about exoplanets, right? That's right, yeah. It, it's, uh, it's our first pre-recorded talk, so some of us have chosen to pre-record them just um, for technical reasons and to make sure we fit them in on time. Um, so. I'm going to play the video now and then Phil will still be here afterwards for questions, okay? So yep. uh, I'll play the video now and um, remember to write your questions in the chat on YouTube and uh, we'll answer them afterwards. So thank you very much. Let me just find it. Yep. What I kind of did today was look at, you know, exoplanets, some of the interesting worlds that we have you know, discovered so far and how we might actually find them as well. So that was kind of what I wanted to go through. And actually, I've got an interesting image there on the screen, which is actually Pluto. So, you know, quite a long time, well, so only until quite recently, we've got quite close up images of Pluto. And we thought it might be just a kind of boring ice world. But actually, when we get spacecraft nearby, you know, it's a really exciting, um, interesting world. So I'm going to kind of introduce how we find some exoplanets and some of the most interesting ones because doing some actual research again this week I've updated some things and I found some you know, really interesting planets that have only just been discovered. So I will mention them kind of at the end but where are we at the moment? Well at the moment we've got just over 4,000 exoplanets that have been confirmed. There's about a similar number really, which we would classify as candidates. So candidates are planets that we may have had a weak signal for, we may have had just one signal, so we can't confirm them, but we've got a you know, pretty good idea there might be a planet there. So this number is likely to increase quite significantly. But I've put a plot on the side there, which shows you the number of detections or the, num yeah, the number of actual planets discovered per year. So you can see kind of we didn't really have much you know, from the 90s, then one or two. And then, you know, from like 2010 onwards, we've had a huge explosion in exoplanets. And that's predominantly thanks to the Kepler Space Telescope. So that was designed to look at hundreds of thousands of stars at the same time and detect planets that pass in front of them. And it released, well, you can see there where it released some of its data. Um, you got a huge influx of detected planets there, which is the green. So, that's kind of where we are. That was taken from the 4th of March because actually they haven't updated their website today. So that's the latest one I've got to show you. So detection methods. There's two main ones. Now there's actually quite a lot, but I'm not going to go into them all because the main ones are actually from the transit method. So this is where a planet passes in front of the star. So it passes in front of the star, blocks out some of the light. We detect that dimming of the star. We can detect a planet. It's fairly straightforward. It's not that complicated. The only hard thing is, is the planet's got to be a suitable size that we can detect that dipping of the light. You then also have um, a radial velocity method so that you may be more familiar with the Doppler effect. So when something's moving away from us at some speed, you get a stretching of the wavelength. If it's light, it can be any other wave really. Um, and we would call that like a redshift. And if it's moving towards us, we get a blue shift. Now we think of planets orbiting stars, but in reality, they both orbit a common center of mass. So that common center of mass is actually closer to the star. So the star just appears to kind of have a bit of a wobble. We can detect that by measuring the light, measuring the shift in that wavelength. So those are the, the two most common methods for detecting an, uh, an exoplanet. But it's worth noting at the bottom there, we have actually directly imaged planets around other stars. So Maybe I didn't mention at the very start, when I talk about exoplanets, we're talking about planets that are orbiting stars other than our sun. So these are not in our solar system. These are a long way. But the fact that we've actually got images of these planets, quite exciting actually. And at the bottom there, you've actually got four big planets orbiting a central star. So you've got B, C, D, E. Um, they're quite big, obviously. And they're, they're quite a long way from the star. So on the, on the scale in the bottom right of that picture, you've got 20 AU. Now, one AU is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So you can get a feel for how far away those planets are from their star. It's easy to detect. They're not close to the star. 
we can see them because they're not blinded by the light from them. But what I really want to kind of go over today was just the transit method, because it's the one that you don't necessarily have to have any understanding in physics or mathematics to get an idea of how it actually works. It's a fairly intuitive one to understand. But first, we're going to have a look at variable stars. So we know that when we're looking for a planet that passes in front of a star, we're expecting the brightness of that star and the magnitude of it to change, so it would actually get dimmer. But there's lots of other reasons why stars would actually change their brightness. And a lot of stars, they don't, they're not static, they don't just stay a set brightness. And if you look up into the sky long enough, you'll see stars do change in their brightness. And I've got, a, there's an Im image here taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of a particular variable star. And this is actually kind of um, a long way in another galaxy. I mean, you can see it's kind of a changing brightness and almost colour as well. And then on the right hand side, there's another one in the centre of that image. You can see it getting brighter and dimmer. So we have these types of variable star. And um, these particular types, they also, um, well, they pulsate. So here you can see the star actually pulsating. Um, and they, they do actually physically change shape. So they get bigger and they get smaller. And as a result of that, they become more luminous and less luminous, and it causes a regular pattern in how bright they are. And interestingly, those type of stars are actually really useful for calculating distances because the period that they, they kind of pulsate at directly relates to how bright they actually are. So if we can measure how bright they are or their apparent magnitude, we can work out how bright they actually are if we were next to them and we can work out a distance. So we use it as a standard candle, so they're quite useful, um, but we're not interested in those. What we're interested in for planets is this type here. This is where you have the planet passing in front of the star. It blocks out some of the light and you would typically get this U shape dip in brightness. Now this particular graph shows a flat bottom on it, on the bottom of that U, but that's not necessarily the case um, because the star itself is spherical, um, it's brightest in the centre part as it passes across, so it has a bit more of a curved bottom like a U as opposed to a flat bottom. But anyway, that's what we're looking for. And that U shape dip in brightness against time as it passes in front can tell us a huge amount of information about that planet. So I'm not going to give all the equations here, but if you want to, they're not actually that difficult to actually derive and work out. And if you were doing kind of the physics of the universe module, this is something that we kind of cover at the beginning of that module. So you've got that U-shaped dip in brightness. So we know the stars dim down. We can work out how much it dimmed by. So actually the vertical bit and how much it's actually um, decreased by can tell us how big the planet is. Because if you think about it, the only thing that matters there is the ratio of the size of the planet to the size of the star. And if it's a set ratio, it's going to take out a certain percentage of the brightness of the star. So we, we can basically measure how much light is missing once the planet's in front, and that directly tells us the radius of that planet. We can also work out its orbit. So for those who are familiar with Kepler's laws, things like that, if we have planets further away from their star, they orbit slower. So they have a, a lower orbital velocity, they have a longer orbital period. So in the case of this transit here, as they pass in front of the star, it takes a longer time to actually pass in front. So the width of that can tell you its orbit, basically. So you get a huge amount of information just by looking at that fairly simple structure. And to give you an idea of that in practice, this is Kepler 11. So this is a system discovered by the Kepler Space Telescope. It had six planets in it that passed in front of the star and they were all detected. Now on the left hand side, you've actually got the individual transit as it passed in front of the star. And you can see you've got that U-shaped dip. But you can also see they're all very different. Some of them are quite deep, some of them are shallow, some of them are quite wide. Now that all, that all directly relates to the size of the planet and the orbit where they are. So if we pick out one as an example, so looking at that, I would say that planet E is probably going to be our biggest one because it blocks out the most amount of light. So if we go across to planet E on the actual the legend we have on the other side, which is 
I think it's like a purple colour, it's actually four and a half times the radius of the Earth. So in astronomy, we use units that we can relate to. So if we say it's a few million metres or 100,000 metres, it doesn't mean much to us. So we actually compare to other planets. And a lot of the time we compare to, to Earth, to Jupiter. So here we're using Earth radiuses, and you can see that capital 11E is our largest one. So just by looking at that structure, we can work out, you know, how big they are and where their actual um, orbits are. So on to the habitable zone then. So it's all good finding these planets, but are there any kind of suitable for life? Well, one of the key things we need to look for is the habitable zone. So we've probably heard about this before, but what it means is it's got to be the right distance from its star to have liquid water um, on its surface. So the Earth is kind of just right. Venus is kind of a bit too hot and Mars is kind of a little bit on the outer edge. So we're just right. So what we need to do is look for stars and planets around them where they're kind of in the right location. And it, it does change because stars are not all the same size. They're not all the same brightness. So small stars, planets have to be very close. Big stars, they've got to be further away. So it's just it's just the distance we need them to be. Now, this is an interesting system because this is a, a system with seven detected planets. The TRAPPIST-1, it had seven planets and it was also stated as having seven temperate planets. So these were kind of around the habitable zone, a bit like where Venus, Earth and Mars are. So they have the potential to have liquid water on nearly all of them. Maybe the only ones are a bit suspect. But still, it's a very intriguing system. They're all kind of around that habitable zone. But have a look at where they are. It's actually a red dwarf star. And red dwarf stars are very small. They're very cool. So therefore, any planet has to, any planet to have water on them has got to be very close to them. So look at the scale there compared to our system. They're all within the orbit of Mercury. Mercury is pretty close to our star. Uh, so these are very, very close. And to put it into context, really, this is TRAPPIST-1 compared to Jupiter. So if anyone's actually used a telescope to look at Jupiter, you can actually see the four Galilean moons. So you can see Io, Europa, um, Ganymede and Callisto through a telescope or binoculars. Well, this star has its planets pretty much the same distance that those moons are from the planet. This is a very, very compact system. And it means that they, they take about you know, one to 20 days or so to actually orbit the star. They're very, very close. Yeah. But this is the big problem. When they're too close, they have the potential to encounter these kind of large frequent flares. So red dwarf stars are fairly unstable. And I say unstable, they're quite magnetically active. So they frequently have these large flares in comparison to the size that they actually are. And because your planets have got to be close, to be habitable, you know, have liquid water on the surface, they're going to get bombarded by these large flares. So the question here is, are they really habitable? Chances are not. You're going to have these life extinguishing flares that just strip their atmospheres, they sterilise the surface. But the, the thing to take away here is that a lot of these habitable planets we hear about on the news, specifically like this one, a lot of them are orbiting red dwarf stars. So they have to be close to their star. And this is a natural consequence of being close in the red dwarf stars. They have frequent flares. Um, so we just have to you know, bear that in mind. And we haven't really found that many planets that are comparable to ours. A lot of them are around more unique or more hostile systems. Now we'll go on to the more interesting systems. This is where it gets a little bit more exciting. This is not just planets or orbiting stars. This is planets orbiting multiple stars. Now this one here, I'm not going to read out its extremely exciting name, but this is a hot Jupiter and it's orbiting three stars. Now, the orbits of the stars are with the blue lines. Um, so you can see you've got two close to each other that orbit each other. You then have a bigger one orbiting around the outside of those two. And then the red circle, the red line is the orbit of the planet. So the, this planet orbits one star that then orbits another two. A consequence of that is that one quarter of its orbit is always experiencing day. So yeah, for one quarter of its orbit, the whole planet experiences day. So this poses some really interesting questions about what a day might be like on one of these planets, what the season's like. 
you know, imagine being on one of those planets and you've got three stars. How how hostile would that be? Is it are they actually um, habitable or not? And then this is another one which has only recently been discovered. So this one I believe was confirmed in January this year, so only a few months ago. And it was first detected by Kepler, but it wasn't actually confirmed until this month with, with TESS, which is another telescope to kind of re replace Kepler. And this one here is orbiting the binary side. So you've got um, 5A and 5B on the left hand side, and then you've got another star orbiting around the outside. This planet is orbiting with a tilted orbit around the two binary stars, but then has another star going around the outside. Now, hopefully the physicists will realise that we can't have planets forming on orbits like that. We have to conserve things like um, angular momentum. So to have a tilted orbit in respect to the rest of the system suggests it's either been captured, as it you know, could have been a rogue planet with no star and it just got too close and was captured, or there's been some kind of encounter with the stars that has kind of tilted a bit. There's been some interesting dynamics that has happened there. And then that you have Kepler 16b. So Kepler 16b is a Saturn sized planet that orbits around the outside of two stars. Now, the really interesting thing about this one is it's in the habitable zone around two stars. So it's a large gas giant orbiting two small stars, but it's in the, the zone which we would be able to have liquid water. Now, some studies have been shown that you can actually have a habitable, well, I won't say habitable, but an Earth-sized moon orbiting around it, which is stable. And if it's in the habitable zone, it has the potential to support water. So you can have a moon around this planet that may be habitable, which is an intriguing idea. We haven't been able to rule it out with our models. It can it can be stable, even though you've got two stars that it's orbiting. Now, as a general rule, you have two types of planets that orbit multiple star systems. So with the P type, they orbit around the outside of all of the stars. Now this normally would be a lot more stable because they're going around the outside, the movement of the stars has less impact on the orbit of the planet. So they're a bit more stable. And then you have the S type. Now these are orbiting one of the stars and then those stars are then orbiting each other. So you have a lot more complicated dynamics occurring there and they're not normally stable. They can't normally form like that either. So they're very interesting systems, but they wouldn't necessarily form in that current situation. So they pose some really interesting questions as how they actually got there. Now, you're probably all aware with tidally locked objects because we, we see one nearly every day, actually. So when we're talking about tidally locked planets, we're talking about an object or a planet that would always have the same face facing towards its star. So think of the moon, we only ever see one face of it. As it orbits around the Earth, it rotates once per orbit. So it means that it's always facing towards us. And it's the same for planets. We know that if they get too close to their star, you get a tidal kind of locking. So they evolve to the point where th their rotation is slowed down by the tide from the star and they will become tidally locked. And a lot of the planets we found have been close to their star. And therefore would be tidally locked. But are they habitable? Well, we can't rule them out actually. They might sound quite hostile places, they're very close to their star. They've always got the same face facing towards them. So you're going to have a completely scorched surface that's always in daylight and you have a very cold night side because it never gets any, any sun or any light. But there has been some studies done that suggest you could have a habitable ring around them because if they've got an atmosphere what will happen is they will heat that atmosphere the, the air rises it will then go around to the back of the planet and it will warm the back of the planet but a consequence of that is you have very very large winds so you can have winds on the order of thousand kilometers per hour so you know are they habitable you could you could potentially have enough light, enough temperature, but you're going to have extremes elsewhere, like with the wind. And then this one really kind of caught my eye actually this week. So this is a new one that's been discovered very, very recently. I believe actually in the last few weeks. 
So this was discovered by the TESS telescope, and it's actually six large planets, and the five outer ones are in resonance with one another. So when we talk about a resonance, what that means is that their orbits are ratios of one another. So for example, um, for the inner, the second inner one, planet C, that does 18 orbits, but planet D does nine orbits for the same period of time. And then planet E is six, planet F is four, planet G is three. And that means they're all in resonance with one another. And it causes some interesting dynamics really, because they all will always pass each other at the same location. Now, this is actually the largest resonance system to date, like this, because actually Jupiter's moons are one, but there's only four of them. This is six large planets all in resonance. And if that doesn't make any sense, maybe some swings do. So if you think about um, what's happening here, when you want to actually push someone on a swing, um, you will always push, push them at the same point at the swing. And as a result, you kind of build up that force in that direction. You kind of get a resonance. Um, the, the point is your excitation frequency needs to match your natural frequency. So you're, in this case here, your excite, excitation frequency is when and where you're pushing, and it has to match the frequency of the swing. And it's the same idea, really. As the planets pass by one another, their gravitational force on each other causes some fairly exaggerated dynamics. Um, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be stable forever, but it just means that you're, you're creating some force in the same direction at the same time each time, and it causes um, some interesting dynamics. And then finally, I'm just going to finish with exomeans because I kind of quite inter I'm quite interested in these really, because we found a lot of gas giants. If you go onto the exoplanet archive and have a look at what planets we've found so far, the vast majority are big gas giants that are too close to their planet or too far away. They're not habitable. But if we take our own system, our own solar system as an example, well, there's, there's two moons that really jump out and they're not in the habitable zone, yet they have liquid oceans. So on the left hand side, you have Europa, which is orbiting Jupiter. You can actually again see this with a telescope in your back garden. And this is a frozen surface and I suspect the liquid ocean underneath. And it's a long way from the actual the sun. And Enceladus is even further away because that's orbiting Saturn. So why have they got liquid oceans? Well, they have this interaction with the planets. So it can be tidally induced. So the, the actual tides from the planet can internally heat and that can offer some kind of um, liquid oceans. There could be some other mechanisms that's not fully understood, like there could be some radioactive decay, which is internally heating them. But the key thing is they have liquid oceans under a frozen surface. And what does this mean? Well, traditionally, if we took the habitable zone around different stars, so we've got red giant, uh, sorry, red dwarfs at the bottom on the left, nice red colour, and as you get bigger and bigger, they kind of get brighter, they get hotter. Now, to have a planet in a habitable zone, you'd have to be in that, that thin green region. But if you start to consider objects that are internally heated from some form or another, you can extend that zone outward. So have a look at that light blue and dark blue region. You can start to look for, pl for planets that may harbour moons. If the moon is big enough, it can have some internal heating and you may be able to support a liquid ocean, which is quite you know, intriguing, really. But have we found any? Well, not today. So it's kind of been on off, really, with, with Kepler 1625b. So this is a large planet. It's about 10 times the size of Jupiter. It's not small, but it was thought to have a moon the size of Neptune orbiting it. So remember at the beginning, we looked at the transit shape and we saw that you got that nice U shape dip in brightness. Well, if you had a moon orbiting it, that shape would be a bit distorted. Depending on where it was when it passed in front of the star, it changes the shape of that transit. And the signal to noise ratio of this was fairly poor and they, they keep going back and forth whether this is actually a moon or not. And that just puts into context how hard these are find, to find. This is a Neptune sized moon orbiting a planet 10 times bigger than Jupiter, and we still can't confirm if it's actually a moon or not. So we, we don't really have any evidence for them at the moment. 
but hopefully going forward we will. And then I'm just going to finish with Europa and Enceladus really. And this is kind of what we think really. So this, you've got a nice image of Europa at the bottom and an illustration of what we expect to find under that surface. So we can work out the surface by the way that the spacecraft moves nearby, how the local gravity, gravitational field changes. Um, and we can measure what's being thrown out into space. So we know that they're throwing out water ice and various um, material which could support life. So that's in Europa. And then you have Enceladus, which is kind of the same really. And we expect to have this frozen surface along with this liquid ocean and you know, these thermal vents at the bottom. And I would like to think going forward that we can make these some of our key targets for exploration. Because we've been there, we know that they're quite promising, but you know we should really kind of um, go more down onto the surface and investigate kind of what's there. But that's kind of where I'm going to leave it. Um, hopefully, it's kind of been interesting for you all. Um, yeah, and thanks for listening. If you have any questions, pop them in the chat um, or on the. Okay, thank you, Bill. That was great. So we've got lots of time for questions, so please do um, ask some questions in, questions in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. I'll start us off. So I think um, you mentioned some recent results in that talk, right? From a few yep. weeks ago, I think you said. But I yeah. think, I'm not sure if you're allowed to, to talk about this much or not, but I think there's some more in the pipeline, right? Yeah, so the way that obviously discoveries work, you, you can't just make a discovery and go and tell everyone about it. Um, so we had, well, there is a discovery waiting to be published, um, which should hopefully be next week or the week after, but there will be quite a few new exoplanets being published. The results will be coming out, um, but they've basically been discovered in the same way that I discussed in this talk. And they're, they're well, Lincoln has been involved in their discovery, which is quite exciting. Um, so yeah, so I'd say wait until next week. Um, There'll be a press release by NASA and there'll be a few exoplanets um, released, basically. OK, so I, I always wonder this and I don't know uh, if, if it's an easy answer or not. Um, but what makes something a planet? OK, so, yeah, so it's kind of a good question, actually. So why not just have any spherical object and call it a planet? Yeah. Well, oh, if I come to the first classification, you probably think, well, OK, a planet's got to orbit a star. Um, and in order to do so, it's going to have to be smaller than a star. So a planet is, it doesn't generate its own or a significant amount of output in energy, whereas a star has nuclear fusion in its core, it's generating a lot of light. Um, that's basically a star. Below that, you have a bit of a transition period where they're like brown dwarfs, so they're kind of, they do have some internal heat, but they're not, they don't have fusion. Um, so basically, they're not generating their own light or their own energy in their core. However, they don't have to orbit a star. So there's a lot of what we classify as rogue planets. These are planets floating around in space without a star. And they've been thrown out into space during the formation process. And there's quite a few of them about. Um, they just float about. So it's, it's about size, really, purely okay. size alone. Um, yeah, yeah I mean, that's the issue with classification, right? There's always kind of blurry you know, boundaries and stuff. Yeah, and we can probably touch on Pluto actually since we're here. Um, so Pluto is quite small. Um, it has an unusual orbit. It has a, an orbit more familiar with the outer um, carbon bulk objects or the, the object toward the outer part. But some of the moons are bigger than Pluto. So mm -hmm. I think it's Triton of Neptune is the same composition, the same sort of object but it is actually bigger than pluto and that's a moon so it's just worth thinking about it's not always about size yeah. okay good so we're starting to get some questions now so uh chris and uh, zg say thanks phil that was uh, interesting then we've got another question from uh, change my name says uh, does learning about exoplanets reap any benefits for society here on earth <sighs> um it depends how deep you want to go into that i suppose yeah, it's probably, why do we need to do it? What are we going to learn from it? Well, if we look at the bigger picture, and the bigger picture is our planet's not going to be around for that much longer. Okay, when I say not much longer, um, astronomically speaking, it, it's going to come to an end at some point. The The sun will go to a red giant. It won't be habitable anymore. So we, we do need to find what we can, what we 
places to go to um or do we just float around in space and spacecraft so it does it does purse or serve a purpose in that sense that we don't have a we don't have an infinite amount of time left on the planet at some point we do need to decide what we're going to do if we're still around but the technology used is useful elsewhere so discovering planets is not easy yes i showed you that when they pass in front of a star they block out the light but the signal to noise ratio of that is incredibly small so we're developing new imaging techniques purely to do that which will carry over to different areas yeah. so it's the same with all kind of space exploration space technology we have to derive or find very complicated ways to find things and they naturally can be used elsewhere so yeah, and I guess, uh, like learning about as many other planets as we can, can maybe tell us something about the kind of things that can happen to this planet. Exactly, yeah. Maybe we find planets that look like our future, or exactly. more than the past, and it can help us gauge where we're going. Yeah. So there's a question from Harry that's kind of similar to what we just discussed. And what's the difference between a planet and a moon? Is there anything more to say on that? Yeah, so it's purely down to dynamics, really, I suppose because you can put a moon size object on orbit around the, the sun or a star and it's no longer a moon. But if it's orbiting a large gas giant, so for example, Triton around Neptune, if that was floating around on its own, it's likely to be a planet. Hmm. Well, okay, orbit, if it, had a, if it had a planetary style orbit, it probably would be, but if it's orbiting another planet, then it becomes a moon. So it, they typically have to orbit something else to become a moon. So it's as much circumstances as anything. Yeah. Uh, so a uh, uh, question from Orth, I think that's how you say that. Uh, yeah. Would a protostar be classed as a brown dwarf? Uh, no, purely because it comes down to size. So a protostar is that transition period as the cloud is collapsing. So it hasn't fully undergone any nuclear fusion at the time. It's not hot enough, but it's it's still collapsing. So it's starting to heat up, and most of its heat's from the gravitational collapse. A brown dwarf is typically going to be smaller, so it's going to be in some kind of equilibrium point, so it's not collapsing further. I mean, there is, it can be difficult to distinguish, because let's say they could be the same temperature, and from a telescope, they could look the same, they could have the same energy signature. So they are difficult to find, but you can typically find out if it's a protostar or a brown dwarf by the lithium content, if you can do the, the, um, take the spectrum of the light coming from it. Because a protostar would have higher convection currents in it and it circulates the lithium and you can burn lithium before you can do nuclear fusion of hydrogen. It happens at a lower temperature. Okay. So yeah, you can do a lithium test basically to figure it out. Okay, okay. Um, good. So there's a question from uh, Jack. Can exoplanets form around black holes? And if so, is there any way to detect them? Okay, so the first question you have to ask with that question is, what's a, what's a black hole? Uh, as a general rule, a black hole, if we're talking like a stellar black hole anyway, so that's a black hole that's formed from the death of a large star, if you've got a planetary system around that star before it went supernova, what's going to happen to the planets? They're unlikely to survive that catastrophic event anyway. So you're left with then a bit of a blank canvas, I suppose. And I'm going to say probably not because the, the tidal environment is going to be enormous. Mm. So if, they, if they're within a black hole and they're not a long way off, then the tides are just going to rip everything apart. I mean, if it's a long way from the black hole, they can form. But is it part of the black hole or is it just nearby? It's a good question. But typically, if it's a stellar black hole, it would have had to have gone through this catastrophic supernova explosion, which would have decimated anything nearby. Now, we are finding planets orbiting stellar remnants. So white dwarfs, we found planets orbiting them. We've also found planets being pulled apart and falling onto them. So these are not the size of black holes, but they are very dense and they are the leftover remnants of a smaller star. Okay. So uh, since you mentioned it, and since we've got quite a lot of time left, you mentioned tidal, tidal forces, I think. And so that's uh, maybe something you could just explain quickly if, if you can, what, 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 what is tides, what are tides? 
So tide, think of them as like a bit of a, a shearing flow. So the closer you are, then the tides are going to be stronger. So in order for you to orbit on a circular orbit, in fact, actually a good example is probably Saturn's rings, actually. So the closer edge of the rings orbits faster if it's on a circular orbit than the outer part. So if you look at it from above, it's like a shearing flow. So imagine like a, a flow of water, but one edge is flowing faster than the other. And if you drew a line across that, it gets stretched. Yeah. So that's what we would classify as like the tidal environment. And the closer you are to that orbiting or to the, the main object, the stronger those tides are. And it's why it's why moons and planets don't form close in. They all form further out. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. So we've got some more questions. Uh, one more from Arth. Can a uh, kind of a, a follow on to Jack's, I think. Um, can the black holes catch rogue planets? There's no reason why not. A black hole is just a mass. And if it's the if it's the leftover remnants of a large star, then it actually will have a lower mass than the star it formed from. So because actually it's the central core mostly. It's the same with a neutron star or a white dwarf. What's left over is the central core. The outer layers are blown off into space. So actually, they're, they're not necessarily massive. They're just very, very dense, or however you want to describe them. So yes, the gravitationally wise, as long as you're not too close to them, they could orbit at the same distance a planet would have orbited the original star. Yeah. So capture-wise, there's no reason why not. And it's an interesting idea. And if you were around a black hole and you had a planet, you know, what are you going to get there? Because there's no light. So it's not going to be habitable. I mean, I know in Interstellar they did have planets, but they also had this very hot accretion disk around it, which was even more dangerous, but we'll forget that. Yeah, so there's a, another question, the same question again. So that's two people asked the same question. So it's a good question. Hmm, yeah. You just mentioned this accretion disk. Is, is yeah. that what is that what was imaged? Uh, yeah, so, okay, when was it, a couple of years ago now? They said, oh, we've, we've imaged the first black hole. Well, technically, that was never true because you can't image a black hole. But what they have done is they've imaged this accretion disk around it. Now, when we talk about that, it's a disk that is falling onto the black hole. It's how stars form. Oh, sorry. It's how planets form around a star. They have this large accretion disk or close in. And some of it falls onto the star, same with a black hole. But with a black hole, it's superheated so that it's gravitationally compressed. It heats up and it gets very hot. So what we actually saw was the disk around the black hole, which was all distorted because if you know what the space looks like around a black hole, it's all bent, distorted. And it's a very interesting optical illusion if you look at them. But yeah. Okay. Um, so this question of life, I, I, we have to address it, I think. It's kind of popular at the moment, right? Yeah. idea of uh, alien life. Um, so I, I always find it useful to make the distinction, right, between um, when we talk about habit habitability of planets. Are we talking about in principle or uh, for us, right? It's a very different thing. Yeah, so when you say habitability, um, you've just got a massive broad window, haven't you? What does that actually yeah. mean? I think when we traditionally think about it, you're thinking comparable to Earth it, so that we could walk around on the surface. Um, but actually, life can survive well quite outside of that boundary, really. Um, so habitability, it depends on what you're considering, really. And I suppose the next question people might ask or want to know is, let's say we find these planets. How do we know if that's got life on or hasn't got life on? We can't physically go there um yes. yeah but what we can do is we've pretty much ruined our atmosphere or we've polluted it so if we were to take the spectrum uh, or the um the emission spectrum or absorption spectrum of the planet so if it, as it passes in front of the star to get that transit we can actually do a i think it's a transmission spectrum so it's it goes through the atmosphere we can look at the spectrum of the light anything that's been absorbed by it so we can work out what's in the atmosphere. And we have done that to a number of planets. Now, if it has life on, there'll be biological signatures there. Um, if there is advanced civilizations that's chucking out loads of pollution, we can measure that. And they are actively looking for those signatures, which is exciting. So we can, although we can't go there, we can get a, a feel for it. So is that, some, is that infrared spectros uh, spectroscopy then, probably? 
Um, you could do it across a range, really. Um, so a, a lot of the, a lot of telescopes can measure well quite a, quite a range of the spectrum. Actually, it depends specifically what you're looking for. Um, the infrared emission is very useful for looking for direct imaging of planets. So you can look for an ex uh, like a um, an infrared excess that's not there due to the star, and you can look for it next to it sometimes. Okay, very good. Um, so uh, I think we've answered all the questions. I'll, I'll just flick through again. I think we got them all. Yeah. Um, so do you mind, Phil, if I, I've got your YouTube channel open actually, do you mind if I? Yeah, yeah, pop it on. In fact, actually, um, it's probably, yeah, a good opportunity to show what other stuff we have available. So. Okay. Um, yeah, so you've been making some quite a lot of tutorial videos recently. So they're all on kind of Twitter and YouTube and stuff. But yeah, yeah. So if you're interested in kind of um, astronomy, space, studi studying it further, or just a general interest, then I've put lots of short videos on a YouTube channel that cover just a range of topics. Really, some of them are kind of the transition point to A level to university. Some at university, but they should be understandable if you've got an interest in it. Um, so yeah. Okay, so we've got a few minutes left, um, but I guess we'll just finish early then if there's no more questions. And next we have our first live uh, interview with a current student, uh, Chris. So he's waiting in the lobby. Um, so that's due to start at quarter two, um, but I think we might as well just uh, start now. Um, so thank you very much, Phil. That was really, really interesting. Lots of uh, brilliant pictures. I always enjoy looking at your, at your talks. Yeah, that's uh, always the, the benefit of astronomy, isn't it? You can just use yeah. pictures. Uh, no, it's really good. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. So what I'll do now is I'll add Chris to the stream. And, uh, Hello. Get rid of Phil. Hi, Chris. So Hi, Chris. cheers, Phil. Right, bye. And uh, yeah, I'll just crash, uh, chat to Chris for the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, maybe if we finish early, that's okay. We can go for uh, lunch a little bit early. And um, we've just got, a, in fact, uh, Phil, are you yeah. still there? Absolutely, yeah. We've got one more question. We do have time for one more question. So, Chris, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, if that's okay. Yeah, uh, sure. So, could tidal shifting heat a planet that is too close to a red dwarf, like the ex examples before? Uh, yes, but you get tidal migration, so it only occurs for a finite amount of time. So, it's the same as the Earth and the Moon. Um, if you have an elliptical orbit, so it goes towards the star and then further away each orbit, each time it does that, it's a, a stretching and squeezing of the planet internally, which can tidally heat it. Um, obviously, the rotation slows down, but that heating energy has to be lost from somewhere. Mm. So that's how you end up with tidally locked planets, where you have one side facing the star. The bigger problem with red dwarfs, as we mentioned in the talk, is these flares they have, and you have to be very close in order to be habitable. But I suppose you're suggesting that you could internally heat them further out um but yeah i'm not sure red dwarfs are the best place to look for life just in general um they, they, have, they have a few issues yeah. okay so thank you very much uh, uh thanks for coming back uh, thank you alfred and everyone else who asked questions they were really good questions and um, so yeah you can go, go now for good properly now, oh, thanks <laughs> see you later bye um okay so chris hello hello so you are a first year physics student right Yes, that is correct. Yeah. So I wondered maybe we could start if you could tell us a little bit about how you ended up here doing physics. Um, you know, how did you make that decision? Um, okay, well that's that's a funny one. So I I started um, when I was at school. Um, I should start off by saying I'm a mature student. So yeah. I came to the university a bit later uh, than most. And initially, I wanted to do. I think it was um, chemical engineering or something when I was at school, uh, but purely because it was the the first thing that came to mind. Um, okay. It didn't interest me, um, but I was like, oh, I'll, I'll just choose something. Uh, that fell through because I didn't do very well in my A-levels and I thought, oh, well, I'll get myself a job and, and work for a bit. Um, but I ended up watching a lot of uh, YouTube videos from uh, channels like Veritasium, mm -hmm. uh, Physics Girl, play, you know, uh, PBS space time those sort of YouTube things um, that really got me interested in physics um, and so I decided I was like oh okay well what can I what can I do with this um, 
and I really wanted to challenge myself as well because I I kind of fed up of working a, a right. menial job for. <laughs> yeah. for well, it's, it's good, right? It's never too late. You know, you don't have to go straight into university yeah. from A level. You can you know do other things first and then decide actually I want to go to university. Yeah, there's exactly. a lot of pressure to get for people to finish A levels and go straight to university. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. I think I felt that a lot um, when I wanted to come back. I was like, oh, how is this going to be for me? as a mature student coming into a uh, university, but yeah. you guys are really welcoming and uh, it helped joining in at the Science Foundation here as well, because that gave me a head start to, is what I needed really. Yes, yeah, so you would have been taught by Dave actually then, who, who gave the first Yes, talk. yeah, unfortunately I missed his talk um, and I'm sure he won't, <laughs> um, but it was, uh, he was, he's a brilliant lecturer and uh, yeah, they're all good. really, really good, so. Yeah. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, when you were deciding what university to go to, um, how did you decide that? Um, well, one of my friends uh, actually came to Lincoln and yeah. Lincoln wasn't my first choice um, first time around. I had to apply twice because I didn't get accepted by anyone on the first time around. Because right, okay. for some reason you needed physics and maths as an A-level to get into the physics course. Um, so I it thought, does it, yeah, it does help. So I had to, do, I had to uh, take an A-level in physics um, a couple of years ago. Uh, in order to come here um but you guys offered me a place um when I decided he just said it he said to me it was like it was a really good university and he he really liked the environment and the lecturers and he had a good relationship with the lecturers so I thought okay yeah let's let's go for Lincoln yeah so I think I think kind of it's not I mean there is BTEC and there are other routes I think other than kind of available and um, yeah of course yeah you, yeah you need to have done physics obviously to do mm -hmm. physics at university um Okay, so uh, how you know we've kind of got a list of questions we're asking everyone. Um, how does studying at university compare to your expectation? Because when you arrive, right, you don't really know what to expect. Um, but yeah. you may have some idea. Um, I just wonder if it's you know how close were you? Is it very different to what you thought it might be? Um, I think I, I had a good idea. Obviously, I just uh, I just done that A level in physics, and I think I had already started to manage my time quite well so mm -hmm. the, the learning aspect actually came quite easy to me um but i like you said you don't really have any expectations i i think you because it's so sort of it, it is a relatively difficult course i'd say and i and i think because of that it's very hard to say oh i know exactly how it's going to go and i know that i'm going to do well in this subject because then something will pop up that you've never heard of before and you think oh that's uh that's bizarre this is actually really quite confusing um but i think the the right support lines are here and and there's always there's always been someone that knows what question knows the answer to what question you have um but for me i think it was very it, it definitely wasn't what i expected um i'd but say I guess it's a lot more difficult I guess the first kind of couple of years of your degree have not been, uh, let's say, uh, during the most normal of times, right? So university yeah. has been very different this year than it has been in previous years, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that has I think that has more of an impact though on your like um, on your mentality towards it. I think if you've still got the right you know mentality to keep working, you can still do quite well. Yeah. Well, I think that you you mentioned something really important there about. Um, kind of managing your time and stuff. So this is when I give outreach talks to A-level students and GCSE students. One thing I always try and emphasize is that, you know, to succeed at university, um, you really need to be able to learn independently. Hmm. Right, would you agree yeah, with definitely. that? definitely. Oh yeah, yeah, I would 100% agree. I think um, the important part is being able to not have to rely on on other people to be able to give you the information you need sometimes you do just need to spend a few hours googling things and looking up tutorial videos and, and searching on um wikipedia and, and all sorts just to get some definitions down um and it's not going to be one of those things because by the time you leave you're going to want to know uh how to solve any sort of problem exactly. so you know very good um so what's been your favorite part or the most, what have you found the most interesting part of the degree so far? Um, well, if I'm honest, things like this, really, I, I didn't know okay. that um, things like this were going to be, were going to be an option. Um, and I always liked um, the sort of, I guess, public speaking part. 
Um, but I think these sorts of opportunities at the university never really, uh, I never really expected them. Um, and so when I, I applied to be a, a course rep in uh, foundation year, and uh, I got that position and I ended up sort of opening a lot of doors where I was able to do things like work with the, the university staff on helping develop the modules and things like that and ended up joining a lot, uh, being involved in a lot of meetings and um, then ended up doing a few things like this as well. So that to me has been really surprising, but really, uh, really brilliant at the same time. Yeah, there's lots of stuff to do at university uh, kind of besides the actual learning the the, the subject right there's lots of um, clubs and societies and uh, roles yeah. within your program that you can take up um okay brilliant so um i don't know if this you know i don't know if you have a good answer to this yet but uh what what do you plan on doing uh, after you you've graduated well i had a few minutes to prepare and uh, okay. <laughs> and i and i've decided my future <laughs> No, um, but in all seriousness, I, I think I would like to do a PhD. Um, I think the idea of conducting research for me has been quite interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I'm currently doing the EUROS uh, Undergraduate Research Opportunity Scheme, which is another thing I should have mentioned on the last question, actually, is something I didn't expect. Um, and the most interesting part about that is that I get to do research with another lecturer. So I think something like going along the lines of a PhD um, is is definitely going to be the way to go. So just to kind of uh, say, because the people in, who, uh, who are watching might not know or probably don't know, that's a scheme we run at the university here where um, uh, students can apply for a six week summer project so that they're paid a, a bursary, kind of living costs, um, and they do six week uh, research project with a member of staff. Um, so limited places, it's not like everyone who applies gets one. I think there's around 10 to 15 uh, positions every year across the whole university but we regularly get you know at least two or three in the school of physics every year um so i didn't actually know you were doing one this year oh yeah um I'm doing what with, doing? yeah um i'm working on running simulations on uh s something called lamella block copolymers so that's a, a bit of a mouthful but um, with marco yeah that's with marco yeah um the, the School of Mass and Physics has quite a big link with uh, nanotechnology, I think, is a, is a big thing for our school. Um, but essentially, we're applying a shear to this collection of this collection of polymers um, and seeing how that affects them. Um, but the, the good thing is we've got a supercomputer that we can use so we can run simulations. So once you've developed a, a code that describes it really well, you can then run these simulations on it and uh, see what the outcome is. So. That's essentially what we're doing. Brilliant. That sounds uh, interesting. Yeah, so Marco, I, I've seen some of Marco's uh, stuff and it's very like interesting. Pretty pictures, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, very nice yeah. pictures. I do like pictures. Yeah. Um, okay, so thank you very much. I think we'll leave it there. We'll finish slightly early for lunch. Um, and we'll be back at one o'clock. It will actually be my talk. Um, I'm talking about the Butterfly Effect, so I've worn my T-shirt. Oh, very um, nice. So, yeah, please come back at one. We're going to leave the chat the um the stream running over lunch and um, so i'll just put up the schedule and i'll put my email address at the bottom yeah, so if you need to email me or ask me anything you can find my email address on this on the stream um, and we'll be, we'll be back at one o'clock um, so thank you very much chris and I'll, I'll see you soon thanks very much matt talk to thank you soon you. bye 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 so to give me one moment uh, i'll find the schedule Okay, so thank you very much, and I'll see you uh, at one o'clock. So uh, have a good break.
Oh. Hello. Welcome back. We Hi. are uh, at the second part of the workshop and uh, we are here with Matt Boot, that is a lecturer in uh, the School of Math and Physics. He teach in second year Lagrange and Hamiltonian Mechanics and Laboratory 2. And is going to talk about uh, chaos theory, what is the butterfly effect. Okay, thank you, Manu. I'm just going to try and find my video. So I pre-recorded it. Yeah. Uh, I I Sorry. practiced it and it was way too long, so I recorded it and edited it down into a short time. Um, so I'm just going to play the video, but uh, I, I have the luxury of being able to pause the video when I want. So I'll pause it um, at certain points just to kind of add stuff or ask questions. Okay, so I'll start now. Hello and welcome to this talk on the butterfly effect. Now some of you may have heard of this before, but the idea of this talk is to link this back to an area of mathematics called chaos theory. I will start by giving a quick overview of what we'll discuss. So first we'll take a look at popular culture to see if we can gain some vague understanding of the butterfly effect. Then we'll look at chaos theory itself. So we'll look at the development of this theory around 50 years ago now. Then I'll introduce something called determinism and I'll talk about uh, portraits in state space. And this will allow us to discuss an example. Okay, so we'll look at something called a rotor versus a kicked rotor. Okay, so these are very simple systems. Uh, they're very similar, but a rotor is non-chaotic and a kicked rotor is chaotic. And I'll finish by talking about predictability. Okay, so this is where this idea of determinism will come back in. When many people hear the words uh, butterfly effect, the first thing that will come into their heads is this film from 2004. Now, I must say I haven't actually seen this film, so I have no idea why it's called The Butterfly Effect. And I've also not seen either of the sequels. I didn't even know they existed. Um, so this, for me, isn't much help. However, I have definitely seen this episode of The Simpsons uh, several times. It's from 94 and it's called Time and Punishment. Um, I'm not going to play it for copyright reasons. The thing I want to kind of draw your attention to from this episode is this line from uh, Grandpa Simpson. If you ever travel back in time, don't step on anything, because even the tiniest change can alter the future in ways you can never imagine. Okay, so if you want to kind of know why he says that, you can go and watch this episode. But like many Simpsons episodes, this idea is taken from elsewhere. Okay, so this episode is a reference to this book by Ray Bradbury from 1952, where uh, a group of time travellers go back in time one of them accidentally kills a mosquito or something, and when they return to the future, lots of things have changed quite significantly. So, for example, there is a different president than uh, the president when they left. And when Homer comes back from the uh, past in The Simpsons, it turns out that Ned Flanders is the president. Okay, so this uh, book has also been turned into a film. Um, I also haven't seen this. Uh, I didn't know this existed. But to summarise, uh, popular culture uh, this idea of the butterfly effect, where small changes in the past or the present can kind of grow into big changes in the future. This has been around for a long time, uh, at least since the 1950s. Okay, so let's talk about the birth of chaos theory itself. So the discovery, if that is indeed the correct word to use, of chaos theory is usually credited to Ed Lorentz. He was a mathematician, so he got his undergraduate and master's degrees in mathematics. But during the war, the Second World War, he worked for the army in the US as a meteorologist. And he enjoyed that so much that after the war, he continued to work in meteorology. So he was interested in the uh, instability of the climate and the atmosphere. So this is a plot from one of his papers. So on the horizontal axis there, we have time. And on the vertical axis, we have some parameter. We don't really care what to do with the weather. Okay, so the lines we see, these are computer simulations of the weather. Okay, so we see on the left, they start very close together, but as time progresses, they uh, start to diverge. And by the time we reach the right-hand side of the plot, they are really quite different. Okay, so these are computer simulations that start with almost identical conditions, but very quickly they uh, evolve into very different states. 
Lorentz gave a very famous talk called Can the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil cause a tornado in Texas? And it seems he got this idea of using this kind of way of uh, presenting this idea from one of his colleagues, the name of whom he couldn't remember. Um, but this colleague said, you know, about this theory of atmospheric instability, um, if this is correct, then one flap of a seagull's wings would forever change the future course of the weather. So for some reason, uh, Ed Lorentz changed this from a seagull to a butterfly, and the butterfly effect became very famous. So there's this quite amusing cartoon at the bottom here that seems to imply the butterfly is some sort of evil genius, um, but it could easily have been called the seagull effect. And if you want to maybe think a little bit more about why the butterfly became more kind of prominent than the seagull, you can go and read this blog that I wrote with a colleague of mine around two years ago. If you look carefully, you can probably make out the URL, but if you can't find it, just email me and I'll send you a link. What you're seeing on screen now is the abstract of a famous paper by Lorentz from 1963. So I don't expect you to read all of this. I mean, feel free to pause and read it if you, if you wish, but I just want to draw your attention to this line here. So it's again, the same idea of slightly differing initial states evolving into considerably different final states. So again, this idea that we saw with uh, Grandpa Simpson, where even the smallest change can grow into uh, effects you uh, don't necessarily expect. Um, but I'd also like to draw your attention to this word in the title. So this theory of chaos in uh, dynamical systems is still deterministic. So this idea of determinism is what I will talk about next. But first, let's just summarize uh, about the birth of chaos theory. So chaos theory, you know, as we know it as a mathematical theory uh, was developed after computer simulations of weather systems showed extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. So this extreme sensitivity means even the smallest change in the initial conditions can have big effects later down the line. So now let's talk about determinism. The rather long quote you see on the screen here by Pierre Simon Laplace is commonly referred to as Laplace's demon. It's probably worth saying now that the, uh, the word demon in those times didn't necessarily have such a negative connotation as it does now. It merely refers to um, a supernatural being or supernatural intelligence. I'm not gonna try and read this out. What I'm gonna do is try and explain this idea of determinism in the context of classical mechanics. Classical mechanics is probably the kind of physics you're familiar with. So projectile motion, the motion of astronomical bodies, and classical mechanics is deterministic. What it means is that all we need to know is two things, right? So the physical state of the system. So this is what Laplace calls the respective situation of the beings which compose it. So it here being the universe. And two, a set of general laws that govern motion. So here he says in red, in the same formula, the movements of the greatest bodies in the universe and those of the lightest atom. So these are laws of motion that apply to all different scales of, of size in the universe. And if we know these two things, if we know the physical state of the system and the general laws that govern motion in that system, then we can perfectly predict, so nothing would be uncertain, the motion produced by an applied force. So this idea of determinism is that if we know the state of the system, if we know the general laws of motion for that system, then uh, we can predict the effect of some applied force. Okay, so it's about predictability. So this second part, a set of general laws, we're not really gonna focus on this today, but hopefully you are familiar with Newton's uh, three laws. So the first one is that objects in motion tend to stay in motion and objects at rest tend to stay at rest unless an external force uh, acts upon them. Two is that the change of momentum of a body is proportional, directly proportional to the net force acting on it. And three, to every applied force, there is an equal and opposite reaction force. So hopefully these are kind of known to you. If they're not, that's fine, because they're not really particularly important for the rest of this talk. What will be more important though, is this first part, this idea of the physical state of the system. So that's what we're gonna look at now. So in mechanics, in you know classical mechanics, when we talk about the state of a system, all we mean is the things we need to know uh, in order to describe the system. So these are what we call dynamical variables. And it turns out, so just from experience, that the two things we need to know 
if we want to describe the dynamics of a system are the position and momentum of all the parts of the system. Okay, so let's consider a really simple system. We have a straight wire, okay? And on that straight wire, we put a bead. Okay, so this is a one-dimensional problem, you know, as simple a system as you can possibly imagine. So we can kind of describe the position of this bead on this wire with a variable x. So this is our coordinate for the system, right? x as a function of time. And we can think about momentum if, you know, at the moment this is this this bead is still, so it has no momentum, but if, if we give it some momentum, it's going to move, like so. And we can give it a little bit more momentum, and it will move some more. Uh, it can be in a different direction. Okay, so we need to know the position and the momentum of an object, and if we know those two things, we uh, know exactly the state of the system. Okay, so determinism. A deterministic system is one in which we can perfectly predict the future if we know two things, right? Those two things being the knowledge of the current state of the system and knowledge of uh, the dynamical laws that govern uh, that system. So now we are familiar with what we mean by the state of a mechanical system. Let's introduce this notion of a state space and then go on to talk about portraits in state space. So consider the space of all possible states. So in other words, all possible values of x and p. So this is an abstract mathematical space where one dimension is associated with the position, so here that's x, and the other dimension is associated with the momentum, so in this case that's p. So just to remind you, this is the simple system where we have a bead on a wire, so the bead can move, you know, it's, it can change position in the x direction, so in this state space that's this x axis, and it also has a momentum in this x direction. So in state space, that's this P axis. So this one dimensional system, this bead on a 1D wire, the corresponding state space has two dimensions. So if we imagine this bead was instead free to roll on a table, right? It could move in the say X and Y directions and it would have a momentum in the X and Y directions as well. So this would actually have X, Y, P, X and P, Y. So it would have four dimensional state space which will be impossible to draw. So this state space can only really be drawn, you know, properly like this on a sheet of paper for a one dimensional system. Um, but the reason we do this, the reason we have this kind of mathematical space of states is that we can represent the states of a system at some given time um, by drawing a point in this space. Right? So for example, I've got this red dot here could represent the state of this system at some given time. So we take this point, we draw a line down to the x axis, and that tells us the position of this state. And we draw a horizontal line to the vertical axis, and that will tell us the momentum of this state. Okay, so this point tells us the state of the system. And what we can do is we can track what the system does over time by following this dot around. And we can kind of leave a trail behind. So we can draw a line in state space that tells us what happens to the system as it evolves in time. So for example, uh, like this. Okay, but I just drew kind of a random line. In reality, we want to know the kind of things that can actually happen, okay? And the things that can happen are the lines of constant energy. Okay, so assuming energy is conserved, right, which is you know quite often the case, the kind of states will follow lines of constant energy in state space. And these um, maps, if you like, of uh, lines of constant energy is called a portrait. So I'm going to show you an example and then talk through uh, that example. So for a simple pendulum, with the caveat that we're only considering small oscillations, the phase portrait or the state portrait, if you like, so the series of lines of constant energy, look like this. So they're concentric circles. So this is quite similar to um, how on weather maps sometimes you get lines of constant pressure. These are called isobars. In our state space, we have lines of constant energy. Okay, so just to point out here, we're talking about a pendulum now, uh, rather than a bead on a wire. So instead of x, here we have theta. Okay, this is the angle of the pendulum. We can describe the position of the pendulum using the angle, um, just like we can describe the position of the bead on the wire using that x coordinate. Um, but what that means is, this p, if you see here, is really uh, p theta, right? So it's the angular momentum. So this vertical axis p is the momentum that corresponds to the coordinate 
on the horizontal axis. And, you know, technically we have an infinite number of concentric circles, okay? You know, we can start at any given energy and there will be some concentric circle that kind of uh, matches that energy. So just like on this weather plot here, we have one line that's 29.6 and we have another line that's 29.7 and we can always fit some new line in between those two lines. So here it's 29.65. Um, but that gets quite messy, so we're just going to kind of draw 1, 2, 3, 4. And I will always just label the momentum P, you know, regardless of which coordinate we have. If it's X or theta, I'll just always use P for the momentum. Okay, so this is what uh, these phase portraits are, these state portraits. They're kind of lines of constant energy in state space. So for a pendulum, as I've said, we have these concentric circles. So let's think about why this is actually a circle. So let's say we start the pendulum uh, like so. So we're measuring um, angle uh, in the anti-clockwise direction. So this, you know, if the pendulum was pointing downwards, that would be zero degrees, okay? If it's kind of at a right angle to the right, that would be pi over two. So hopefully you're familiar with uh, radians, the units of angle, uh, radians. And if the pendulum was pointing upwards, that would be pi degrees. So this is my first pause. Uh, I miss. I recorded this quite late last night after a long day, and I misspoke there. So this would be pi radians, not pi degrees. And I also make the, state, the same mistake in a second. So just to say, these are radians, not not degrees. So, sorry. And if it's pointing to the left, that would be three pi over two degrees. And when it comes back down to the bottom, okay, that's two pi. So zero degrees is equal to two pi degrees. So that's going to be important later. So when we start the pendulum here, look, there's no momentum. We're kind of fixing it in position, ready to let go. So it's not moving at the moment. So it's ha it has zero momentum. So that's why we're on the kind of horizontal axis there. Um, but it has a positive angle, okay? So that red kind of segment. Okay, so its angle is maybe pi over four. And when we let it go, it's going to uh, start moving to the left. Okay, it's gonna start moving down to the bottom. So it's gonna have some momentum in the negative direction and its angle is getting smaller. Okay, so we're moving down in the vertical direction and to the left in the um, horizontal direction. And as it keeps moving, it's gonna go through the bottom point, right? The, at some instant, the pendulum is gonna be vertical. And that's when it will have maximum momentum in the negative direction. Okay, so the angle there will be zero and the momentum will be maximum in the negative direction. And then it starts to swing back up in the other direction to the left, right? So it will have a, ne a negative angle here. So now the it's kind of negative in the horizontal direction and its momentum will start to decrease. So it's going to kind of move upwards in the vertical direction. And when we get to this kind of maximum swing to the left, right, it's going to instantaneously stop before it changes direction. So again, just for an instant, the momentum is zero and we have the maximum angle in the negative direction and then as we know it's going to start swinging back towards the middle again but now the momentum is in the positive direction so it's moving to the right in the horizontal direction this is the angle getting smaller but um, it's moving up in the vertical direction so this is the sorry this is the momentum in the positive direction growing and when it swings back through the middle okay it's going to again have maximum momentum but this time it's the maximum positive momentum and the angle is zero and you know so on so we go round this circle as the pendulum oscillates around zero degrees okay so let's kind of look what that looks like uh, as we play the movie okay i'll play that again a couple of times okay so when there's no energy loss, right, when energy is conserved in the absence of air resistance, this pendulum will just keep oscillating at the same amplitude forever and the dynamics in state space can be represented by a concentric circle where this kind of point just keeps going round on this circle forever and ever. But in the presence of air resistance, uh, maybe you can kind of have a think about what would happen. So uh, maybe we'll pause now quickly and see if anyone can tell me what will happen in the comments. So uh, I don't know if anyone wants to be brave and uh, suggest what might happen. I'll give you maybe 20 seconds or so. It's fine if you don't. I'll just show you the answer in a minute.
Yeah, good. So someone's got it right already. That's, that's very good. So uh, in which direction will it spiral? Inwards or outwards? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well done. So I'll just carry on playing then. So obviously when I'm recording this, I don't know if anyone will get the right answer. Then. But what happens is we see it spiral inwards. Okay. It's not following a line of constant energy. The energy is getting smaller and smaller and smaller as some of the energy is dissipated. Um, and eventually it will come to rest, right? And it will come to rest pointing downwards. So the angle will be zero and the momentum will be zero. So it will come to rest at that center point there. So let's just watch that again. So it spirals inwards and comes to rest at this uh, center point. Okay, so that's uh, two things that you've probably never heard of before, state space and portraits in state space. So how the state of a system changes over time can be represented by lines in state space. So these lines of constant energy make up a portrait in state space. So using this kind of very abstract way of looking at dynamics of systems, let's then look at these examples of a rotor and a kicked rotor. So finally, let's look at an example. So we're going to look at a rotor, which is a very simple system, and it's essentially a pendulum in the absence of gravity. So when we think about a pendulum oscillating around uh, theta equals zero, um, it's the gravity that causes it to oscillate. So in the absence of gravity, it will look like this. Okay, it will just rotate around its pivot um, forever in the same direction, you know, either clockwise or anticlockwise, but it won't change direction um, and it will stay at a constant speed. So that's a constant momentum. So you can think about this as a pendulum um, on the International Space Station, for example. And what I want you to think about now for a, a minute or so is um, what does the portrait look like? So what is the portrait in the state space of a rotor? So I'll pause it again um, and I'll see if anyone can get this one. It's a little bit harder. And if you don't get it, you might kick yourself when you get it. Cause it, it when you see it, it's kind of obvious. But to get there from, from nowhere, it's um, quite difficult. So I wonder if anyone can suggest what the um, state space, the portrait in state space for this uh, rotor. Uh, sometimes people call it a rotator. Uh, for obvious reasons. Anyone uh, suggest anything? So from, remember for a pendulum we saw uh, concentric circles. What would we see now? No, so it wouldn't be a semicircle, no, no. Good thinking, I mean, um, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure uh, if that's close to the answer or not. Maybe when you hear the answer you'll think you, you, you might think that that was quite close. Um, yes, so it's, it's a line. So a semicircle has part, you know, part of a semicircle is a line. So maybe you were along the right lines. So it is a line. Um, we see a series of lines rather than a series of uh, circles. And yes, parallel to the x axis. So that's very good. I was just about to ask if they're horizontal or vertical. Um, okay, so they're lines parallel to the axis, to the uh, x axis. So, so they're kind of constant momentum and the angle changes, right? So the momentum is constant, uh, but the angle is constantly changing, okay? Yeah, good, so let's carry on. Now, what does it look like? So again, um, because I'm recording this uh, beforehand, I don't know if anybody suggested the right answer, but this is what it looks like. So here, instead of circles, we just have a straight line. So remember, you know, like we pick some starting point Right, so we pick any point on this state portrait and we follow these lines of constant energy. Right, so here we see these are horizontal lines, so the momentum is not going to change, which is uh, what we want, and the angle is going to get bigger and bigger in the same direction. Okay, so this initial state will just kind of do this. But what happens when we get to the end? Well, if we think about uh, this kind of system, right, we start at the bottom here, say, and we kind of go around like that and eventually we get back to the beginning, right? So 2 pi, which here is about 6.3, is the same coordinate as zero. So what that means is these two red dots are the same angle for the system. So what we get is this kind of thing here. So it's going to go to the right. So this is going um, anti-clockwise. It's going to keep going. You know, it's going to disappear off the right and come back in from the left, a bit like Pac-Man, right? And 
if we kind of do this higher up at higher angular momentum this means it's just going to go faster it's the same thing but it's going to go faster and we can go even higher in angular momentum and it's going to go even faster still okay so i'm probably going to pause here and very quickly kind of talk about this um, a little bit more Yeah, so all I wanted to show you here was um, a way of thinking about this. So I've drawn this, um, where's my camera? This state space on a piece of paper, right? It's just flat, but you can co consider rolling it uh, around this vertical axis, and you end up with uh, kind of a cylinder, okay? And these states, these um, trajectories go around the cylinder like this. Okay, well, likewise, you can uh, roll it around the horizontal axis. And you also get this continuity, if I can do it properly, right? So you can think about rolling this space, this state, uh, space um, kind of up into cylinders, okay? So we can write down some really simple equations to describe the dynamics of a rotor. So here's the first one. We're working um, in uh, discrete time intervals because we want to uh, code this, you know, we want to simulate this. Um, and this first one just tells us that the angle at time t plus 1 is equal to the angle at time t, so the angle immediately before, plus the momentum at time t. Um, so this just agrees with what we know about the momentum being the change in angle per time interval. Okay, So this is just describing um, you know, the, the basic law of how the angle changes in time. And the second equation is even simpler. The uh, momentum at time t plus 1 is equal to the momentum at time t. So momentum doesn't change over time. Momentum stays the same. So we saw this before, right, when we looked at how states evolve in state space, right? We saw that they follow horizontal lines, which means that, you know, they don't move up or down in the momentum direction, and the momentum stays the same. But as we move up vertically, right, the dots still move horizontally, but they do so faster because the momentum is higher. And when we're, when we're at the top, it's even faster, okay? So really simple equations allow us to kind of generate this state space. This was done in Python. I can share the code. If you'd like to see the code, just let me know, and I'm happy to share that. So what about a kicked rotor? Well, uh, as the name suggests, a kicked rotor is a standard rotor that is periodically given a kick. So by a kick, we mean a boost in the momentum. So the first equation, which just describes how the angle changes given the momentum, uh, stays the same. But the second equation uh, changes slightly. So we see here there's this additional term uh, plus k sine theta t. This k is just a parameter that we can choose that allows us to control how strong the kick is. So for example, if we pick k equals zero, then this uh, last part of equation three um, plus k sine theta just disappears and we recover the equation two that we had before. And, but if k is not equal to zero, then we have to account for this sine theta. Okay, so this sine theta, you know, it can range from plus one to minus one, depending on the value of theta. Okay, so this tells us the strength and direction of the kick that we give the rotor. And that depends on the angle that the rotor is currently at. So this is what introduces the chaos. So a good question here is what does the portrait of a kicked rotor look like? In state space so i don't expect you to be able to come up with that so i'll just go ahead and show you so here we see a series of images uh, that shows the state space as we increase k from zero um, up to uh, around eight okay so when k equals zero as we uh, expect we recover the standard state space of a standard rotor but as we increase k slightly above zero we start to see these straight horizontal lines become a bit wavy and we actually see these uh, orbits appear at the top and bottom. Okay, so these are kind of reminiscent of the uh, circles we see in the pendulum state space. Okay, and we keep increasing k, and we start to see an increasingly complicated structure. We see lots of little circles appear, so it really quickly becomes quite complicated. As soon as k reaches about 0.8, we see these regions of orbits, these circular orbits, separated by like a sea of fuzziness. Okay, and it's this kind of noisy area where chaos occurs. And as we keep increasing the value of k, these islands of uh, stable orbits get smaller and smaller. And 
eventually when we reach k equals around 8, um, the whole state space is filled with this kind of noisiness. So what's actually going on when we have this kind of noisy structure in the state space when we have high values of k? Well, let's think about um, the case where k equals 0 as uncooked spaghetti. Okay, so we can lay the spaghetti uh, so that it kind of goes horizontally. So the spaghetti is not cooked, it's rigid and it's straight and all the spaghetti pieces are parallel. So we just travel along these uh, straight lines. But if we think about the k equals 8 case in contrast as cooked spaghetti, then if you pick two pieces of spaghetti that are close together at some point and follow those along, you'll notice that you very quickly end up in very different places. And the intermediate values of k, so say k equals 0.05 for example, this is when the spaghetti is slightly cooked, you can kind of bend it a little bit and you can, you know, as you increase k, as you cook the spaghetti more, maybe some of it will be pliable enough to kind of form loops. And as you keep increasing k and increasing k higher and higher, you cook all the spaghetti. And at some point uh, when k is around 8, all the spaghetti is cooked and you just end up with this uh, mess. It's like a spaghetti junction, right? But you still follow individual strands of spaghetti, but those strands just take you to very different places, even if you start close together. Okay, so I think finally it's time to look at some simulations. So what I've done here is I've just picked two points in this red dot that are very close together, extremely close together, and I've just run two simulations, okay? So the starting points are very close together. And when we have k equals zero, this is what we see. As we expect, you know, they kind of do the same thing. Okay, so this is a non-chaotic rotor, um, where k is zero, and you know, they do uh, non-chaotic stuff, which is hardly a surprise. Um, I'm not going to show all of these, just for in, in the interest of time, but if we go to k, I think this is around um, uh, 0.5 or something, um, then we see uh, here where, where our red dot is, we're still in this region um, where we have well-defined lines, okay? But now they're circles, so we're oscillating, uh, like we do for the pendulum, um, except now the oscillation is around uh, pi radians instead of zero radians. So this is like an inverted pendulum. Okay, so if we keep increasing k, we get to here, we see it looks very different, um, but our starting point is still in this island of uh, non-chaotic behavior. Okay, so we're still on one of these orbits. Um, so we should still see oscillations, and indeed we do, except they're much, uh, you know, the, the, the period is much uh, lower because our orbits are smaller. You know, we're on this smaller circle. Um, but then if we increase k even more, uh, now, you see the red dot is in a region where we have this noisy structure. So now we would expect chaotic behavior. Okay, so hopefully we will see this. So yes, indeed, we see these two simulations, even though they start with almost identical uh, initial conditions, uh, very quickly uh, diverge. They very quickly start to do uh, different things. And then if we look at this last one, then clearly um, it'll be very, uh, very chaotic. Okay, what we can do is move our red dot, so let's just choose somewhere different. So now we're making the initial angle smaller, but we're making the, the initial momentum uh, larger. So I've picked two starting points in this red dot, and uh, we'll see what happens, okay? So I'm not going to show you the first few, I'm going to start here, um, just because the first few are the same as the last lot. So, you know, we're in kind of an interesting region already, so we see some really interesting kind of behaviour. Um, and it, we see that it stays together for quite a long time. I think if we, if we, watch, if we watch long enough, we'll see that they... Uh, so now they're starting to look quite different. Okay, and then if we increase k even higher, then by this point we should see a really chaotic motion. But I think if you look carefully at the first few frames, you'll see they perfectly match. You may have to pause this and kind of watch very slowly, and hopefully you'll see the first few movements match up, but then they separate. So maybe you caught that watching live, but please do go and uh, watch it back slowly and you'll see the first few uh, steps, they kind of mirror each other, but then they diverge. And then if we increase K more and more, you'll see that it, it's almost immediately chaotic. So for this one here, where we saw this uh, very small time where they did the same thing, this is uh, gonna be very important, okay?
Yeah, so we see here, we're just completely chaotic. So this example, simple example of a rotor versus a kicked rotor shows us the difference between non-chaotic behavior and chaotic behavior. So the kicked rotor is uh, one of the simplest examples of a chaotic system. And when we make the kicks really strong, the motion appears to be random. So I've put appears to be in bold there for a reason. And we'll discuss that now when we talk about predictability. Okay, so a chaotic system is still deterministic. Okay, it is not random, um, but it is sensitive to initial conditions. So remember I said uh, for a system to be deterministic, you know, if we know the state of the system and we know the general laws that govern the motion of that system, then we can perfectly predict uh, the motion produced by some applied force. But the problem is, we can never make a perfect measurement of the position or of the momentum. So these values we put in as our initial conditions, we can never really know them exactly. Okay, the numbers we put into our calculations, our simulations, can never be infinitely precise. And for a chaotic system, even a very small uncertainty about these initial conditions, so even if we have a very small uh, uncertainty to start with, this grows um, into a large uncertainty at an exponential rate. Okay, so I've put this in red because this is part of the definition of a chaotic system. In a chaotic system, small uncertainties in the initial states, the initial conditions, grow exponentially into large uncertainties. So remember the spaghetti, right? If we know the position of our starting point quite well and we narrow it down to two possible strands, if we follow those strands for some time, then that uncertainty in our position grows. You know, we could be a complete edges of the plane. Okay, so this is exponential growth in the in our uncertainty of the position. So hopefully you know what an exponential is. You've probably seen a lot about it to do with the COVID pandemic. Okay, but what this means is the more precisely we know the initial conditions, the further into the future we can predict the motion of the system. And for a non-chaotic system, this this window of predictability extends you know, far into the future, almost to infinity, uh, in principle to infinity. But for a strongly chaotic system, this window of predictability is very, very short, even if we know uh, the initial conditions really well. So remember that going back to that one that kind of stayed together, you know, we looked at the kicked rotor simulation, there was that one that uh, we saw for the first few frames, it stayed together. Those first few frames were really quite predictable. Right, both of the similar conditions stay together, but then that window of predictability was very short. So Grandpa Simpson's quote should really be this. If you ever travel back in time, don't step on anything because even the tiniest change can alter the future in ways you can't predict. So it's not about imagining things, it's about predicting things. So for the rotor, right, we, we know the possibilities. We know all of the things that the rotor could possibly do. The issue is that we can't predict what it's going to do. It couldn't possibly do something we can't imagine, but if it's chaotic enough, if we choose a value of k high enough, then it will do things that we can't predict. Okay, so we're pretty much at the end of this talk now, um, but that was the main thing I wanted to get across, that chaotic systems are deterministic, which means they're not random, and they are predictable, just not for very long. So before I leave you, I just want to point you towards this video by Sabina Hossenfelder, where she gives a slightly different uh, idea of what the uh, butterfly effect could mean. She says, you know, what Ed Lorentz really meant, but he never used the, the term butterfly effect. So it's kind of a moot point, um, but it's a good video. I encourage you to go and watch it. And thank you for your attention. And hopefully we have some time for questions. Hello. Hello. Wow, was very, very, very good. I'm very, very. <laughs> Um, so let's see if there are any, any questions for you. If we just uh, my uh, computer is a little it? low, yeah, can I can see, but uh, there is no happening up, appearing anything. That's okay. So uh, let's start with a funny question. What about your t shirt? You said it was connected to the battery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you well, tell me how? <laughs> yeah, so this, this side is a butterfly, as you can see. And this side is what's called the Lorentz attractor. Mm -hmm. So that's some really complicated mathematics I can't really go into uh, in, in this uh, yes. setting. But basically, uh, uh, 
when Lorenz was looking at this weather system, he had a set of equations and the solutions kind of trace out this shape in, um, in this phase space, this state space. Okay. Um, so that's as, that's as simple as I can make it. Um, okay. But basically, it just happens to look like a butterfly. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Right. So um, maybe that's something to do with why the butterfly uh, won over the seagull. Um, so I can see there is a comment on the YouTube. It's quite a longer comment. Uh, so we're stating that it is hard to predict the effects far into the future is due to the li limitation we have knowing values to precise from including decimal or due to external factors. Yeah, so 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 as I'm you know I'm more of an experimentalist, so I will automatically think about uh, measurement uncertainties. So you can never measure the position of a pendulum perfectly. There'll always be some error in your device that you use to measure. But also, if you go and read that blog post that I mentioned, it talks about the same problem in computational simulations, right? So it depends, you know, to what precision you you're, you're using in your simulation. Um, okay. So we show that if you if you make the um, initial condition of uh, the system uh, 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 a transcendental number like pi that just goes on forever, then you can obviously never make it infinitely precise, right? So you have to cut your number off somewhere. And depending on that choice, you will get different results from your simulation. Okay, good. This is uh, an interesting question. Oh, I no. changed my name. <laughs> One is about uh, will you study studying a physics degree, this kind of effect, or math degree? Um, and oh, well, other... I'll look at the next question then. But, um, <laughs> um, so I, 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 it depends where you go, obviously. Um, it, what I can tell you is it's not on the core syllabus of the Institute of Physics. So a university doesn't have to teach this at undergraduate level. And so it depends where you go. Um, I teach second year mechanics, uh, Hamiltonian mechanics, where this would naturally fit in. Um, but I would put it right at the end of the syllabus and I would cover it if I had time at the end. Because, um, I mean, it's quite ambitious of me to try and teach you to try and talk about this, because um, this is quite advanced stuff. I try to give you kind of a intuitive understanding, but the mathematics behind it can be can get really quite tough. Um, on the other side, we have several projects on chaos. Yes, so uh, I have a couple of students this year who've done their third year project on the double pendulum, which is a famous chaotic system. And so we actually built a double pendulum. We got some motion trackers and put them on the ends of each rod. So we could actually kind of take some data about the position and see if we can do some interesting analysis. And um, so, yeah, you can you can kind of, yeah, sometimes uh, it depends where you go. Do you want to talk about the free will, talking about transcendent? Uh... <laughs> I'd love to, but we've got two minutes. So yes, I would so. encourage whoever that is to, if they want me to, to talk about that with them, I'm happy to do so by email. Um, but that's a really good question. And then uh, there is Chris uh, talking about uh, weather prediction and deep learning technique. Do you think is uh, viable? I would have said so, yeah. I don't know if anyone's doing this work, um, but I would think it would be applicable for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I don't know if there are any questions, but one question is uh, what about applications? What uh, essentially how we can use a chaos theory outside the mathematics and physics? Well, anywhere where you have kind of um, unpredictability, I guess, you can kind of model with chaotic. Uh, chaos theory. So for example, economics, okay. uh, things like exchange rates that are just completely unpredictable. Um, you find uses of uh, chaos theory in uh, quite a lot in economics. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. Um, Any, I don't know if we have an other question, but we have a very, very limited time. So maybe yeah. my suggestion is contact Matt if you have any further questions related to the topic. It's quite a interesting topic so yes please yeah so after you know, that i'm trying to think if i have anything to say quickly about that free will one and um, <laughs> well then it's not really up to me <laughs> um i don't know uh, oh <laughs> yes yeah, that's true. very very great talk yes uh, and I can uh, give you the ball back, and then uh, you want to introduce the search. Uh, I think it's a live uh, talk, right? Or... Yeah, so oh, yeah. Celine, Celine just put a comment about you know, this kind of question of determinism. 
this is really philosophy of science um, yes rather than actual physics um, so you that's the kind of thing you would look at if you did a joint honors degree yes for example physics and philosophy which is becoming more popular yeah, yeah i agree on that there's no free will when you're under a time constraint yeah, <laughs> yeah assignment yes <laughs> um okay so again thank you do you want to introduce yeah let's Sartre? bring Sasha. so now now we have uh, another live interview with Sasha. do you want to stay on manu or, or i don't just... know i'll see as you prefer it doesn't um, well i'll leave you on um so uh here is Sasha. hello Sasha. hi so Sasha is one of our alumni students she was actually uh, one of our first ever physics students. So you, you were here when there was no other students apart from maybe, was it about 10 of you? Uh, yeah, I believe so, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you, you were one of our first graduates. So um, I guess do you want to introduce yourself and tell us what you're doing now, what you've been doing since you left? Sure. So I'm Sorsha. Um I graduated from Lincoln in 2019 with a MPhys. So I did the integrated four-year course. Um, since I left, I've moved over to the University of Liverpool, where I'm now doing a PhD, uh, still working with my physics, but in a much more practical sense. So I'm now based in electrical engineering and electronics. Which is very fun. Very good. Very good. So if you think back to um, when you were deciding what to do, when you were kind of, I mean, the, the people watching this are probably around A-level age, uh, mostly, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, if you can remember that far back, you know, what made you choose physics? Um, hmm. Can you remember? Well, it was many moons ago now. Unfortunately, I am much older than I was then. Um, I always kind of loved physics. I was always one of those kids that was always asking why. Um, and I know that that sounds incredibly cliche and very stereotypical, but it's unfortunately very true. Um, yeah, just I, I always loved to find the root cause of stuff and to find out why everything worked. And, and physics seemed to be the only topic that gave me kind of that satisfaction, that gave me those answers. Um, also, I like to understand how things work and why things work, no matter how kind of um, esoteric or you know the theoretical that may be um and so physics for me always just yeah it just kind of perfectly fit the bill um and it was it, it's been a it's been a love affair ever since i think okay next question is about your expectations so what were your expectation of on university when you start respect to what you were uh, expecting when you apply for it yeah, so I guess kind of in the media, university is always kind of portrayed as this, you know, big, massive halls where you go in and no one knows you and no one knows who you are or what you're doing there. And you just sit there and you take notes while someone writes theorem after theorem and equation after equation on a whiteboard. And then you go home and you learn them and then you get tested next week on the same thing. That is absolutely not what it was. Um, it's very much more about, you know, all of the different kind of skills that you have so there's a lot of maths um there's so much maths there's a lot of um computational work as well that we do at lincoln especially um and it was yeah it was a lot more hands-on which was really great because i'm i prefer working with my hands that's why i've gone to the dark side and gone to engineering now um and so it's um yeah it, it was fun to kind of get to grips with um, working with it a bit more, doing the experimentation, doing some more of the practical subjects. You know, there was a couple that um, really surprised me in there. And th the reality is you form a close relationship with your, um, your lecturers and the people that you study with. And, you know, pe everyone does know you there, um, whether you like it or not, unfortunately, uh, especially if you build a reputation for yourself. So, um, yeah, it was, um, it was much, much better than I expected. I had a great time. Um, you know, I'm one of those people where if I could do it again, I would in a heartbeat. <laughs> well, that's nice to hear. Yeah. <laughs> I promise I'm not being paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, in this case. So, um, what was the kind of most interesting part of your degree? Would you, would you, would you say? Um, definitely probably learning all of the different ways that physics applies to the real world. So, like, all of the stuff to do with, um, you know, just like learning about the statistics and learning about the ways in which um, physics applies in areas where you don't think it will. So we were able to do a couple of topics more on kind of how physics is 
um, active in industry and in like the medical fields. Um, and Matt, you mentioned it ever so briefly, we did a module um, looking at how um, physics and mathematical principles underpin everything to do with the economy. So we had one um, financial kinetics on stocks and shares um, and all that kind of stuff. And that was so fascinating because I think a lot of people put physics in a box, which is very much kind of like stars, space and Newton and that's it. And it is so much more than that. And it was so good to kind of, because even coming from university, you know, even coming from A-levels, you come in very kind of naive, very base level, like, oh, I'm just going to learn some force diagrams and then I'm going to go home at the end of the day. And that is absolutely not what it was. Um, and it was so, yeah, just just so good to see all the different ways in which it works and all the different things that kind of come under physics that you just kind of don't expect and don't hear about so much. Good answer. Um, yeah, very good. Um, yeah, so I, I, one thing I wanted to ask you uh, also, because you've gone on to do a research, uh, you're doing research stuff now. Um, what did you do for your project? So I did two different projects. My first project was on um, the encapsulation of um, tertiary quantum dots with hydrophilic polymers. Uh, so quantum dots are teeny, teeny, tiny crystals, really small. Um, and when they get to that sort of size, um, they have all sorts of different properties that's kind of yeah. dictated by their size and the forces that are at play. Um, and so they're used in a lot of different things. I'm still working with them now in my PhD, as a matter of fact. Um, and oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, excellent segue. Um, yeah. And uh, so in my undergraduate, I was working on... Um, some research that had already been done because one of the problems is that quantum dots don't often behave or interact as you want them to with their environment so they can be quite difficult to use uh, one of the ways in which is that they have these massive long ligands attached to the outside that don't like water um, and in order for you to use them in a lot of applications you need them to like water so my project involved um, wrapping them in a little coating that had different arms on the outside that did like water uh, so as you could make them soluble in um in aqueous solutions. So that was really good. That was really, that kind of like set the bar for the other stuff. Um, and then my second project, I was working with the Department of Engineering um, on the process of electro spinning. So if you um, subject a teeny tiny droplet of polymer to some um, quite high electrical fields, it will um, send out a jet of this polymer that is hollow and it's very 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 tiny um, and it dries in midair and you can form tubes and uh, then you can use it to form like uh, kind of webs and lattices and all that kind of fun stuff um, and we were trying to work with them to determine um, the process and how that actually happened because it's still um, a big kind of unknown as to why it works and why it works in the way that it does and you know at, at what point does it dry all that sort of stuff so we were looking at trying to put it in some kind of vacuum, thinking that maybe if we took away the air resistance, we could see what effect that had on it. Um, we were still very in early stages when um, I left, but it was so interesting and it was so much fun. I basically got to play with plastic spaghetti for like three months. I had a great time. It was amazing. <laughs> so uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was really good fun. So next question is, what are you plan for the future? You're doing a PhD now, so. That is a very good question. I'm not really sure. Um, I want to finish my PhD, uh, naturally. I think um, probably after that, I'm not sure if I'll stay in academia, if I'll stay in research, um, or if I'll go out and head into the big wide world of industry and try and work with my subjects. Um, one of our, my lecturers gave me a wonderful piece of advice, which was follow what you love for as long as it'll take you. Um, and then, you know, when that doesn't work, then you look at plan B, then you look at doing something a bit more sensible, maybe. Um, and so right now I have thoroughly chased my tail for the past six years and it has gone absolutely wonderfully. Um, and I don't really intend on stopping anytime soon. So I think when it ends, we'll see what's next and take it as it comes. I know that's not a very sensible or helpful. <laughs> question but it's uh it's a very true one i think it's sensible yeah. sure so um i guess to end, end then um i'll put you on the spot do you have any any advice for the uh, young people watching very much go with your gut 
you know, you'll get a very good feeling and a good sense for places. And even though older people try and tell you that, oh, you're only young, you don't know what that like gut feeling is yet, you do, you absolutely do. You'll know if something or somewhere is right for you or not based on how it feels. And if it feels off and if it feels wrong, don't do it. It's not good. It's not going to end well. Um, it's either going to be way too much work or it's just going to be a bad time all around. You you know, you can feel it when something's right and when something feels good. And yeah, follow follow that feeling and chase it to the ends of the earth because that's, <laughs> that's how you're going to put yourself in the best place and, and make sure that you're happiest. Um, absolutely. That's brilliant. So we've actually... Uh got a question from you two, which I, I, I didn't really think to suggest that people need to ask <laughs> questions, but it's great that you have. Um, I'll encourage that tomorrow. Um, if you could start university again, would you prefer to start studying engineering earlier instead of physics? No. Um, <laughs> I, do, I do enjoy engineering. I enjoy that side of things. Um, and I have, it was one of the biggest insults I received in my physics career was, are you sure you're not just an engineer pretending to be a physicist? Um, no, <laughs> never never quite moved past that one. Um, I do love engineering, but for me, the, the interest comes more in kind of what even underpins the engineering. I want to get to the root cause of everything. Um, that interest doesn't quite go all the way to maths, but that's a different matter. Um, you know, and for me, Engineering does too much of a job of, of, of making itself this big grand R, but the world wouldn't be here without us. And I'm like, yeah, but we're more interesting. You know, we, we get to do the we get to do the cooler stuff. And also, you know, you get to throw gang signs in the middle of your um, exams while trying to work out your curl rules. So what, what could be better as far as I'm concerned? <laughs> yep, no, engineering is the dark side. And uh, I, th I think I've still brought shame on my cohort for uh, disappearing in the way that I have. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. That was uh, fantastic. So what I'll do now is we'll take a three minute break. So you've got a quick break and then we'll have our last talk of the day from Dr. Claire McElroy um, about 3D printing. And so I'll see you shortly. See you. Bye bye. Hello, so welcome back after that short break. Uh, I'm here now with uh, Claire McElroy, who's a lecturer in uh, math and physics. Um, and Claire teaches uh, third year module fluid, uh, fluid dynamics, right? Yeah. That's right, yeah. 
Um, I couldn't remember if it was fluid dynamics or fluid you know, mechanics. Okay, um, so Claire's going to talk about 3D printing. Um, so you're going to stay, it's recorded, right? And uh, you're going to be here afterwards for questions. Yes, that's right. Okay, so yeah, you can ask your questions during the talk or you can put them at the end. Um, it's around half an hour, I believe. So we'll be back later after the video um, for some questions. So I'll start playing now. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, It'll take me a second to find it. Okay. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Claire McElroy. I am a lecturer in the School of Maths and Physics um, at the University of Lincoln. Um, and today I wanted to share with you um, some of the work I've been doing on 3D printing. So I'm a mathematician, um, so I like to use a mathematical approach um, to improve and optimise various processes. So most recently I've been interested in manufacturing, um, so how we make things and how we can improve the things that we make. So whether that be making products um, that are stronger and more sustainable, um, or products that are more easily recyclable. Um, I think these are really important questions um, that we should be asking and indeed um, solving for our manufacturing processes. Um, so today I wanted to talk about a fairly new manufacturing technique um, that is 3D printing um, or is sometimes called additive manufacturing. And in particular, I want to talk about 3D printing with plastics. Um, so plastics um, and in particular single use plastics have had pretty bad press recently um, due to the impact they're having on the environment. Um, but actually, if we can make plastic products that are stronger, and more sustainable, more readily recyclable, then this is potentially a better solution um, to, to some of the non-plastic alternatives that are being um, proposed, and um, which each have their own environmental issues. Um, so these properties, so strength, durability, recyclability, um, all come down to the properties of the plastic material itself. So in particular, the microstructure um, of that plastic um, and how that behaves um, during the manufacturing process. Um, so hence my title today, uh, we're going to look at 3D printing under the microscope. However, plastics are incredibly complicated materials um, and it's very difficult um, to visualize um, the microstructure or individual molecules as they tra traverse quite a complicated manufacturing process using something like a microscope. Um, so today I'm going to show you how we can use a mathematical modeling approach um, to really understand what's happening at a microstructural level um, and we can use this insight to solve some practical uh, problems that we encounter with 3D printing. So there are a number of key advantages uh, for 3D printing in manufacturing. Um, so first off, this is a pretty cheap process. Um, so you can pick up um, a decent desktop 3D printer for just a couple of thousand pounds. Um, and actually, Aldi was even selling um, a budget version in their middle aisle at one point. Um, the ink or the, the feedstock that we use for this printing also comes in relatively cheap um, at £40 a reel. And it's also, um, in principle, relatively easy to set up. So there's very limited training costs associated with 3D printing. Um, I say in principle because I'm going to show you some of my attempts at using the 3D printer um, a little bit later on. Um, next, 3D printing is additive. Um, so this is in contrast to a lot of traditional approaches um, that are subtractive. And um, so the idea is um, to make a product, you would start with a block of material um, and you would shape um, that block um, into your product by kind of cutting or grinding or drilling or removing material. So this creates um, a lot of waste. And 3D printing, on the other hand, is additive. And um, so you build up your product layer by layer using only the material that is required. And um, so there's huge potential here to reduce um, the amount of waste material um, that's produced during your process. Um, and then next, what really, really sets 3D printing apart uh, from traditional approaches is the ability to make customised products, but on a really large scale. Um, so, for example, in traditional injection moulding, we would have to make um, an individual mould for every single part that we wanted to uh, 
uh, produce. Um, so this really lends itself to, to mass production, um, but it's very costly if you want to start making customized products. Uh, for 3D printing, on the other hand, it's very, very easy um, and there's limited costs with just um, printing a personalized design for each and every customer that comes through your door. Uh, so the possibilities um, are huge for customization uh, when you're using 3D printing. Um, so I wanted to start today by sharing um, some applications of 3D printing that got me really excited about the possibilities of this technology. Um, so first off, we've been 3D printing prosthetics uh, for quite some time now, um, so for humans um, and for animals, in fact. And I think this application really highlights um, how 3D printing can really create um, customised products um, that are fit for the user's needs. Um, another nice example in nature is that we've been using 3D printing to rebuild our coral reefs. Um, another example in the medical um, theme, um, it's common practice now to use 3D printing in tissue engineering. Um, so the idea is you can 3D print um, tissue scaffolds um, and you can create quite complicated um, geometries that replicate um, a tissue or indeed um, an entire organ. Um, and then the idea is that you grow um, cells on these tissue scaffolds that's been 3D printed. Now, if you choose um, the right plastic material um, to 3D print your scaffolds out of, you can make um, these tissue scaffolds biodegradable. And um, so that means when you implant um, the tissue into your patient, that 3D printed tissue scaffold uh, will eventually degrade away um, in the body. There's also a lot of interest of using 3D printing in the sports industry. So again, I think this highlights how we can really make personalised products um, depending on the athlete's requirements. And then using um, 3D printing with plastics, we can really start to focus um, on making equipment that's got enhanced protection exactly where you need it, uh, whilst keeping the waste of that equipment um, at a minimal. Um, 3D printing is excellent for making tools on demand. And so I think every university um, experimental lab in the country will have a 3D printer on hand um, just to make and replace kind of small tools. Um, so no more waiting for delivery um, if you break something. Um, but this really comes into its own if you start thinking about taking a 3D printer into space. And so there's huge potential here to massively reduce um, the amount of equipment and the amount of weight um, that you need to take into space with you particularly if you start to think about how you can recycle your 3D printed tools back through the 3D printer to make new tools. Um, the Army is also really interested in 3D printing. So an example here of uh, printing drones on demand um, in remote locations. And um, also a nice example of some 3D printed army barracks um, out in the desert somewhere. Um, so we've now got the capability to 3D print much larger scale structures um, from concrete based materials. Um, so this has really interesting implications, I think, uh, for creating more affordable housing in the future. Um, and then the final application I wanted to share with you today is a bit of a strange one, uh, but we are now starting to see 3D printing emerge even in the food industry. And um, so again, I think this really highlights how we can make personalised products uh, for various individuals. And um, so whether that's just uh, making a custom design with some chocolates, um, or if you start to think about people's dietary requirements, and um, perhaps adding medication to food, creating meat substitutes, um, or creating more palatable food uh, for vulnerable groups. So the applications of 3D printing um, are really are endless, and I'm sure if you go away, have a Google, have a YouTube, um, you'll find some applications that, that really excite um, you too. So let's take a step back now and think about what's going on um, during this 3D printing process. Um, so the ink for this printing process comes, um, it's a solid filament of plastic wound up on a reel. Um, and the idea is you feed this solid filament um, into a heated nozzle. So this is an infrared image um, of our printing nozzle and um, extruding um, some 
um, material onto a bill plate. Um, so the nozzles are really hot, um, so they operate at typically around 200 degrees centigrade. Um, so they're hot enough that that um, solid filament gets heated up um, and the plastic becomes molten and can start flowing um, through that nozzle. So the, the molten material flows through the nozzle until it reaches the nozzle axis um, and then can be extruded or deposited um, onto the bill plate. And the idea is the nozzle can move around in the XY plane and um, distributing this material. Now, the trick is you need to cool off this hot molten plastic fairly quickly. Otherwise, it's just going to kind of flow and spread out on your bill plates. So the trick is to cool it down quickly enough that you deposit a nice cylindrical filament um, onto your bill plate that you can then start building um, on top of. So the idea is you repeat this process layer by layer to start printing um, a three-dimensional object. And as you can see, you can make quite complex um, shapes just by giving the 3D printer um, a CAD design. So what's the problem? Um, so it turns out it's quite difficult to make your 3D printed parts look like the CAD design. Um, so as I said before, I'm a mathematician. Um, I did not spend any of my time at university in the labs um, doing experiments. Um, I smashed way too many test tubes when I was at school, and that's one of the reasons I decided to take maths uh, rather than one of the sciences. Uh, but nevertheless, we had a 3D printer um, in our department, and everyone thought it was a good idea that I should have the 3D printer um, in my office so I could start doing some experiments um, to complement my, my mathematical modeling. So I took the 3D printer, read the instruction manual, decided to give it a go, what could possibly um, go wrong? So this is one of my first attempts at just um, 3D printing a fairly simple robot design that I just downloaded um, off the internet. As you can see, it did not go well. My office also smelt like burning plastic for, for quite some time after um, doing these prints. So um, it turns out it's really hard to get your print settings right um, so that you actually um, print something that looks like the CAD design. So you, as you can see, after many trial and errors, kind of fiddling around with the printing conditions, I was finally able to get this um, little robot structure printed. So as you've seen, this 3D printing is a layer by layer technique. So we make these layered structures uh, where there's lots of joins or weld lines uh, between those deposited filaments. Um, and it turns out these weld lines um, are notoriously weak. Um, so they debond or come apart very easily um, if they haven't had enough time um, to weld together, um, or equivalently, if you haven't got your print settings quite right. And so this is exactly what's happened um, to my robot here. The welds have just um, sprung apart um, and made this mess. And it turns out even if your weld visually looks okay, um, it's usually much weaker than what you would expect um, from your plastic properties. Um, and you can measure this weld strength. Um, so if experiments your thing, you can um, start doing a mechanical test and tear along these weld lines um, and measure um, a tear energy. And this is always, always just much weaker than what you would expect um, from the, the bulk properties of your plastic. Um, so this um, is a real problem for 3D printed products. Um, so if we go back to our tissue, applica tissue engineering application um, I mentioned earlier, we need these 3D printed scaffolds um, to really withstand the weight um, of these cells as they're growing into a tissue. So if we've got these weld lines that are just going to spring apart um, as soon as they, they're put under some stress, um, this is just going to be an absolute disaster um, for your tissue scaffold, which will just collapse um, under the weight of, of the cells as they grow. Um, so we really need to understand how we can fix this problem. So we need to understand this welding process. We need to understand how we can define that there's been enough time to weld. Um, so to really understand this now is where we need to understand what's happening at a microstructural level. What's happening um, to the molecules during this welding process? So um, welding is essentially um, the molecules in that molten plastic um, interdiffusing uh, between the layers before they solidify. And um, so this is a, a molecular simulation of this welding process. 
Um, so the idea is you bring together a yellow layer um, and a blue layer um, and you leave them for a certain amount of time and you can watch um, how the, the yellow molecules interdiffuse into the blue molecules and how the blue molecules interdiffuse into the yellow molecules. And you can see um, as time goes on, the further they're able to travel across that interface um, and the better the world becomes essentially. Um, so if you had an infinite amount of time, um, then um, this interdiffusion process would eventually com um, completely erase the world line. And um, so there would be no memory of there ever being a separation between the yellow layer and the blue layer. So in 3D printing, we don't have infinite time, unfortunately. So um, our time available for, for welding or for diffusion um, is determined by how fast um, your material cools down. So as soon as your molten plastic cools down and solidifies, that completely arrests this interdiffusion process. And um, so all welding will stop once your material is solid. Um, but remember, we need it to cool down fairly quickly because we want to keep that structural integrity um, of, of the filament that we're laying down. So there's a very fine balance here about cooling down um, quickly enough um, to keep your structural integrity while allowing enough time um, for, for the um, welding to occur to form a good weld or a good bond uh, between those layers. We should also consider that we're not dealing uh, with simple particles here. So we've got a molten plastic material and the molecules in molten plastic um, are really uh, big, flexible molecules. And um, so they're actually very long chains um, of carbon atoms all joined together. Um, and these chains are very flexible and um, so they can change shape uh, really easily. And the way they diffuse um, it depends on the shape of the molecule. So if your um, polymer chain are kind of randomly coils up um, in a spherical shape, then it's going to diffuse around quite randomly. It's equally likely to move in any direction. If your polymer chain is somewhat stretched out, though, um, and aligned, and then it might take this more kind of elliptical shape. So due to the asymmetry of the ellipse, um, it's going to be more likely to diffuse um, along its principal axis, um, just because it's easier um, to move in this direction. Um, so the way the molecules diffuse are going to depend on the shape. Um, and the shape of the polymers depends um, on the, the flow um, that it is encountered. So we know that this molten plastic has had to flow um, through this nozzle before being deposited um, on a bill plate. So that flow through the nozzle can actually stretch out um, and align your polymer chains. Um, so they're going to look more elliptical uh, rather than spherical. So to understand our welding problem, to understand how the molecules are diffusing, we actually need to go right back and understand how um, these molecules are behaving as they flow through the nozzle. Um, so what we need is a bit of fluid dynamics. Um, so fluid dynamics is probably one of the oldest areas um, of applied mathematics. Um, it's got a huge range um, of applications um, from aerodynamics um, to predicting weather patterns and um, right down to understanding manufacturing processes. Um, so if you were to come to Lincoln to take um, either a maths degree um, or a physics degree, um, you would have the opportunity to take a module um, in fluid dynamics. Um, so this subject essentially gives us a rigorous mathematical framework um, to study, understand and predict um, how different materials flow. Um, so fluid dynamics is based um, on Newton's second law of motion, and um, so F equals MA. Um, so this tells us that the total forces acting on an object uh, must balance the mass of that object multiplied by the acceleration of that object. Um, or in other words, we can think of Newton's second law as telling us how an object will change its speed um, due to forces that are acting on it. So what makes things quite complicated in fluid dynamics is you can think of a fluid um, as a sea, if you like, pardon the pun, um, but a sea of lots and lots of interacting particles. And um, so under this description, you have lots and lots of particles 
each of which um, you can apply Newton's second law to. Um, so as well as, as well as any external forces that act on the fluid, actually the way these particles interact um, will also tell you about the total um, amount of force um, within your fluid. And so after some maths, we can derive um, an equation uh, that tells us how this fluid uh, will flow um, given certain forces. And um, this is called the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, so in very simple terms, this is what the Navier-Stokes equation looks like. Um, so on the left here, we've got the, the total um, amount of fluid forces um, in our fluid. Um, and this balances the mass density of the fluid um, multiplied by the fluid acceleration. Now, if you've seen um, differentiation um, in your studies, and um, then we find the acceleration of the fluid by taking the derivative um, of the velocity. Um, if you've not seen differentiation, don't worry. Um, you can think of this fraction as just the change in the fluid velocity um, divided by the change in time. So you can see exactly how this comes from Newton's second law. And this is telling us how um, the fluid velocity will change over time um, given um, the fluid forces. So these forces might be external, so it might be something as simple as gravity um, acting on your fluid, or it might be something internal to the fluid, so due to those interacting particles. So it might be something like a pressure or something like a viscosity. And um, so the remarkable thing is that mathematicians are yet to find um, a completely general solution um, to the Navier-Stokes equation. What's even worse is that we don't even know whether a general solution exists. And um, so this is actually one of the um, Millennium Prize problems uh, where you will win a million dollars um, if you can prove that these solutions exist um, or indeed provide a counterexample to say that um, there are no solutions to this equation in general. So even though we can't um, solve this equation completely generally, uh, we can apply it to our 3D printing problem uh, and gain some insight to what's going on. So let's start by thinking about how simple, um, fluid be flu simple fluids um, behave. Um, so something like how a water would flow compared to how honey um, flows. So in the absence of any external forces, um, it's simply the viscosity of the fluid um, that determines how fast it will flow. And you can think of the viscosity um, as the friction uh, between those neighbouring fluid particles in our um, sea of interacting particles. So if we've got something um, that has a very high viscosity, um, so something that like honey, um, that's going to flow much more slowly um, than something that's got a lower viscosity, um, so something like water. And um, so it's much harder um, for honey to flow um, compared to water um, due to that um, increased viscosity. Of course, we are not dealing with simple fluids. We have a molten plastic um, that's made up of these really long, flexible um, polymer molecules. And um, these flexible molecules give rise to lots of interesting behaviours um, in molten plastics. Um, so first thing um, is that they are shear thinning. And um, so this means the viscosity actually decreases um, as you flow them. Um, so a good example of where um, this is used in real life is with paints. And um, so with paints, the idea is you want them to flow really easily onto the wall um, as you're painting. Um, but as soon as you stop painting, you don't want them to drip. And um, so if you can start playing around with the viscosity, and that's how we get these nice paint properties. Um, these molten plastics are also what we call viscoelastic. Um, so that means they show viscous and elastic properties. And so a good example of this is with silly putty. So you can think about stretching silly putty out um, and making it flow or accessing that viscous behaviour. Or you can think about rolling silly putty up into a ball um, and bouncing it. And that's um, kind of the solid elastic like behavior. Um, and these complex fluids also um, do really funny things when you start stirring them. So if we think about stirring a simple fluid, um, so think about your cup of tea in the morning. This is a simple fluid. It's essentially water. And think about what happens to the free surface of your tea um, as you stir it. 
So the free surface will always tend to dip down um, around your spoon um, as you stir it for simple fluids. But with these molten plastics that contain these flexible um, polymer molecules, and um, they generate very different stresses and um, that actually allow the free surface to start climbing up um, the stirrer in this rod climbing effect. And um, so lots of different uh, behaviours um, that we want to try and capture um, in our mathematical model of the um, molten plastic flowing through a nozzle. So how are we going to think about these flexible molecules mathematically? Um, so the key is to think um, of each model um, as a couple of beads um, connected by a single spring. Um, so this is called a bead spring model. Um, so the idea is um, the two beads uh, provide um, the friction of that molecule um, or the viscosity, if you like. Um, and the spring provides the elasticity. So springs can stretch out um, and relax and give you that elastic-like behaviour. Um, and it turns out we, we understand springs uh, pretty well um, due to Hooke's law. So we know that forces in a spring is just proportional um, to the displacement of that spring um, X. Um, so we can represent our polymer molecules um, as this dumbbell, if you like, um, so we can get stretch and relax in a flow. And we can also get the dumbbell um, orienting um, in the flow as well. It turns out that these molten plastics are a little bit more complicated. Um, and that's because there's lots and lots of these polymer molecules all at very high concentration. Um, so the way I like to think of them is like a big bowl of spaghetti, really, where all these spaghetti strands are kind of really well entangled um, and with their neighbours. So the way to think about this mathematically is we can still represent our polymer chain as a spring to give us that elastic behaviour. Um, but this spring is actually restricted um, to this hypothetical tube region. So this allows us um, to restrict the motion of our polymer chains because to move around, um, those polymers are going to have to slide um, around between their neighbours. Um, so, so we capture this behaviour by using a tube model. OK, so now we have um, a nice model to try and understand um, our 3D printing flow um, of a molten plastic material. Um, so we can have some viscous forces in our model uh, from our beads um, in our bead spring model. And um, we can have some elastic forces in our model uh, from our spring that's going to be restricted to a, a tube. And we know this has got to balance um, the mass density multiplied by the acceleration um, of our fluid um, just by Newton's second law. So um, we might want to solve our model analytically um, if it's simple enough to do. So um, get a pen and paper and go through the maths. Um, sometimes it's too hard to do this. Um, so what we can do is start applying some mathematical methods um, together with a computer algorithm um, to derive um, an approximate but fairly accurate solution. Um, so that is what I did for this model. Um, and we can start to think about how um, our polymer molecules are behaving um, in our 3D printing flow. So the beauty of the model um, is that we can actually pick out and visualise individual polymer molecules in our flow. And um, so we've got my 3D printing nozzle here. We're depositing our plastic material um, onto a build plate. Um, and you can see how the polymers become more and more stretched um, as they undergo this deposition process. And you can also see how the polymers um, kind of change their orientation as they go through this 90 degree turn. Um, so what we end up with is this um, cylindrical filament that we deposited, uh, where all the polymers um, are really stretched out and they're actually um, aligned um, in the flow direction. And then the idea is we want this um, deposited material to cool down uh, really quickly. So because the printed material has to cool down um, really quick, um, what happens is all that um, alignment of the molecules is actually frozen in uh, when your filament solidifies. Um, and that's exactly what our model predicts. And it predicts that we get most um, alignment in this bottom region here. Um, so we have this deposited uh, filament where all our polymers um, are going to be um, kind of stretched out and aligned. Um, in this region here. So how do we know that our model is telling the truth? 
Um, so we better check this um, with kind of some real data, if you like. So what we can do is we can actually uh, measure some molecular alignment uh, with what's called a birefringence uh, method. Um, so this is an experiment. Um, it's a, a printed wall of filaments. So filament stacks up um, in the vertical direction. And where there is bright light, that tells us the molecules are aligned. Um, and where there's darkness, that tells us um, our molecules are kind of randomly coiled up. So what we see is that we get all this um, molecular alignment really localized um, to the weld regions between our printed filaments. Um, and that's exactly um, what our uh, mathematical model is predicting, and um, that we're getting this localized molecular alignment um, in this region near to the edge of each filament. Okay, so what does this mean um, for our welding process? Um, so what's happening is as our molecules are coming through this nozzle and undergoing this 90 degree turn, um, all the molecules are aligning uh, parallel um, to the weld lines in our 3D printed object. So um, here, here's a simulation of what's going on. And uh, so now we've got a blue layer coming together with a red layer um, and the molecules are highlighted in green. And um, so on the left, uh, we've applied no flow. And um, so the molecules are just randomly coiled up and they're not aligned. Um, but if we flow them through that nozzle, then the molecules are going to become really nicely aligned and um, parallel to our welds. So if we then start to try and pull our welds apart, um, these aligned molecules make it much easier um, to tear the weld. Um, or in other words, where we have the aligned molecules, um, the welds are much, much weaker. So our model is telling us um, that due to this um, alignment in the due to the flow through the nozzle, um, we're seeing this um, decrease in the weld strength. So, so now we're really getting somewhere, right? So we've developed a fluid dynamics model, and um, it's based on the molecular physics of this molten plastic material we're interested in. Um, and our model predicts that uh, molecular alignment um, due to the printing flow is going to compromise our weld strength in 3D printed parts. Um, and what's even better is that we've validated um, this prediction against um, some experiments as well. So what the beauty of modeling is now, we can predict the behavior for um, any other print condition we like without having to perform any further experiments. So one question we can ask is what happens if we print faster? So if we print faster, we have to force our molten plastic through the nozzle um, at a faster rate. So that increased force um, is going to stretch out our polymer molecules even further. So we're going to get an increase in the molecular alignment uh, with increasing print speed. So what does that mean for our weld strength? So if we have um, increased molecular alignment and um, increased print speed, um, this is going to decrease and the strength of our welds. Um, so printing faster is really detrimental um, to building up the strength uh, between these printed layers. Okay, so problem solved. So what we've shown is that printing faster increases the um, flow-induced molecular alignment and consequently decreases the weld strength. So how can we fix this? Um, so obvious answer, let's just print slower. But the thing is, if you go to the um, to your manufacturer and say, oh, we've solved your problem, you need to print slower. And they are not going to like that because printing slower to them means um, reduced productivity um, and increased costs. And um, so what's really nice about mathematical modeling is now we can start thinking about what other variables we can play around with and um, what to reduce this molecular alignment whilst printing um, at, at a print speed that's acceptable um, to the manufacturer's productivity. Um, so I'll just leave you with um, a couple of variables um, to think about. So um, have a think about how print temperature might affect this story um, and have a think about how the size of the molecules um, might affect this story as well. Um, so just to go back to my 3D printed robot, so um, as I said before, I had to um, fiddle around a lot with the printing conditions um, to go from this disaster of a robot to something that looked more sensible. And actually, that fiddling around and trial and error 
um, amounted to um, either reducing the print speed um, or increasing the print temperature um, to eliminate um, that molecular alignment um, and allow um, the welds um, to bond together much uh, more easily. And then finally, just to remind you um, that there's lots of people out there printing much cooler things um, than my sad little robot. So um, this mathematical modelling approach is highly applicable um, to, to a range of applications um, from medicine um, to aerospace um, to, to military applications. Um, so thank you very much for listening, everyone. Thank you very much, Claire. That was really good. No problem. I forgot to put on the banner on this one um, to remind you to ask questions, but there's already one question. Um, it says, uh, hold on. is this not just an extension of FT equals MV? So um, can you see the questions, Claire? Oh, are they on the comments, Matt? Yeah, the comments. I'm not sh totally sure what F, what T is there. Uh, yes, so I guess um, if you've got, a, I, I'm guessing that time is a time period, a T is a time period, and yeah. V is a velocity. So I think if you had right, okay. So, okay. Um, kind of a, a constant velocity. So, I mean, but you, you kind of used F equals MA in there, right? So that's F equals MA. So, I, I, yeah, I think it's, um, I think the answer is yes, it's an extension yeah. um, yeah. because you would take a variable um, acceleration, which mm -hmm. is your V over T. Mm -hmm. So there's another question from Dylan. Um, can, can you tell us more about the birefringence experiments? Oh, I'll do my best. Using kind of microscope. Yes. Um, so, yeah, the idea is um, you can look at these um, printed walls under a microscope and then um, you shine some cross-polarised light um, through that wall. Um, and that image that I showed um, on the slides is, yeah, indeed under a microscope. Okay. Um, so, yeah, just to put it into context, I guess, um, each printed filament um, is about 300 microns um, in height. So, so yeah, you definitely need a microscope to view that. That would be an optical. Yeah. Optical microscope, yes. Yeah. So you kind of made it easy for me to think of questions because you, you suggested to it at the end there, right? Um, yes. <laughs> what does the temperature have, I think, was one of them? Yes, yeah, so um, obviously if you increase the temperature, so you, um, these nozzles, you can play around with the temperature. Um, so for typical materials, you're looking at from about 200 to 250 degrees centigrade. So if you can increase the temperature in the nozzle, you basically get all these molecules moving around much more, uh, much more quickly and they can diffuse mm -hmm. faster. And um, so this actually reduces the amount of alignment that happens in the nozzle. Um, and as you kind of lay down your filament and it starts to solidify and it's cooling down, all those molecules are going to begin to relax um, by a diffusion process. So if you start off at a hotter temperature, they can actually relax more quickly um, during that solidification stage. So you end up trapping in much less um, alignment uh, when they solidify. Okay. So because there's less alignment, um, your welds are stronger, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, then the same argument kind of applies for the molecule size. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so if you use a smaller molecule, they just diffuse around much um, more quickly and because they're smaller, um, so they can relax faster and you get less um, alignment trapped in. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, good. So uh, I don't know if you were here for Chris's uh, short interview earlier, but he's currently doing um, a project with Marco where he looks at, uh, he's looking at the alignment of um, kind of a co-block polymers. So these are polymers that have two different parts. Um, I'm just wondering if you know of any people doing 3D printing with this kind of polymer? So yes, I think people um, have kind of done proof of concept experiments to show that you can um, 3D print them, you can flow them through the nozzles and you can build up these layers. Um, but in my opinion, I think what's really lacking is that physical insight and um, trying to understand how the flow actually changes um, the molecules and how you can achieve different properties from the block copolymers yeah. um, by looking at how, how the temperature affects them and how that flow through the nozzle affects them. So yeah, I think that's a really interesting area. 
Yeah, so, and then also you kind of, um, you can kind of maybe apply fields and stuff at the same time. But I guess if you want, you, you don't really want such alignment, right? It depends what the application is. Yeah, I guess uh, yeah. so. Um, if you're not that bothered about uh, mechanical strength, if it's yeah. um, if you're more interested in the optical properties, then okay, you can yeah. absolutely start enhancing the alignment, and then the flow is your friend, right? Yeah. And there's um, a lot of applications now. I'm um, just looking at depositing single filaments. Um, so okay. if you wanted to use like a 3D printer to create like wires or um, oh, okay. something yeah. like that. So if, if you're not yeah. interested in mechanical properties, then yeah, you can definitely do some cool things, I think, with the alignment. Well, that conductive polymers. Mm -hmm. Cool, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so what about the kind of limitate? So, so that surprised me that you can really get down to the single kind of strand. That's, that's really quite amazing. Um, but I was going to ask what the limitations are, thinking about the size of the kind of features that you can print. Yeah, so, um, that is, that is kind of advancing all the time, I think, is um, it's a key goal of um, the manufacturers that are making the 3D printers is trying to get down to as small a nozzle mm -hmm. size as, as possible. Yeah. Um, so your limitation is basically if you decrease your nozzle size, you've got very high shear rates um, in the nozzle. And when you're playing around with these polymers, that can often induce kind of insta flow instabilities. Yeah, yeah. So, so the limitation is, is on the shear rates, I think. Okay. But yeah, definitely getting down to kind of micron size um, structures now, I think. That's really good. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got one really good question here uh, from uh, Dylan again. When doing my own 3D printing, is there a way to use your mathematical models and research results at home? Um, th this is something that I'm working on at the moment. I would love to have my mathematical model kind of in a user-friendly um, format. So yeah, that's something I'm working on so I can kind of have it um, online for people to download and play around with it. So watch this space, Dylan, hopefully soon. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Um, so I think I'm out of questions. Is it, we'll kind of wait for a second to see if there's any more questions come on the uh, chat. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, Claire. That was really really interesting um and just thank you for everyone who's who's been watching whether that's at home or in a classroom or even the people watching from the future um thank you very <laughs> much for your kind of uh, visit uh, your virtual visit and then, uh, so we have a, another full day tomorrow schedule uh, mostly maths tomorrow so claire's a mathematician but she kind of uh, was put on the end of the physics day because we had more maths and physics I and mean, this was kind of a little bit of... Uh, this is a little major. mixture of maths, physics, and a bit of engineering, I think. Exactly. I think actually what Saoirse said was um, she started in engineering and went to physics, right? And I think yeah. what she said at the end is the really interesting bit is the physics that goes on in the engineering processes. And this, I think, kind of captures that sentiment. Yeah, we often talk about these things as if they're really distinct areas, right? but there's a lot of overlap. Absolutely, um, yeah. Okay, so we'll kind of stop there if there's no more questions. Um, so we'll be back at the same time tomorrow at uh, nine, nine o'clock. I'll leave the uh, schedule up just for a few minutes uh, for tomorrow uh, before, I get, before I end the broadcast. But uh, for now, from us, uh, thank you very much and see you tomorrow. Thanks, Matt. Cheers, Claire. Bye. Bye. Uh, there we go. So, yeah, thank you.